as symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Welcome in. You're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. I am Cassio Kid. Eric, pleasure to see you again, my friend. Hey, we've been doing this a lot together. Yeah. It, it, it is fun. I'm glad. And I love your intro. Your intro is a little different than Conrad's. <laughs> you say the same thing, but you start cracking up halfway through it, and it just makes it sound more fun, like we're at a party or something. <laughs> I, yeah, like I'm walking I don't through know. the door. I'm walking through the door at the Connor Addison, and there's Cassio down there by the television watching Alabama get beat by Tennessee. And you see me come walking in, and you go, Hey, walk it's Eric Bishop. It's Eric. <laughs> well, I don't know who Conrad yells that at, but he yells it every time. No matter the show, he's yelling with the the intro. So we are here, we are rocking and rolling, and I I'm excited. This is an incredible incredible show we're doing today we are doing scott hall and wcw part two my friend uh you guys almost two years ago eric you and conrad sat down to discuss scott hall and wcw that was your 79th episode back in october of 2019 covered what is the beginning of scott hall's career and time in wcw so be sure to check that out in the archives if you have not done so go over to adfreeshows.com or over on the 83 Weeks YouTube. That is, of course, youtube.com slash 83 weeks. Since uh, since then, you've had Scott on the show, episode 168, Who's the Third Man, discussing his time in WCW. Once again, that is in the archives and on your YouTube page as well. Sadly, Scott has since passed away. Eric, you discussed his death earlier this year on the Sid episode, but now we're going to take a look back at Scott Hall in WCW part two and coming up timing wise, Scott's birthday would have been October 20th. Eric, just your thoughts going into this episode. You know, it's, it's ironic that we're recording this today because yesterday, uh, and and today, by the way, is, uh, what is it? It's October 16th, Sunday. Uh, yesterday there was a crew out, uh, from WWE, for an a and special that's, um, I think it's an A&E special being done on Scott Hall. And it, it, it was really interesting um, because we touched on some things that I had never really touched on before. And, and I'm, we'll talk about some of those things here, but it's ironic that uh, Scott Hall has kind of dominated my weekend this weekend so far, as far as interviews. It's good timing. That means it's uh, it's meant to be a little destiny action for this episode. Let's get into it. Um, We left off, you guys left off, after his return from rehab at Slamboree and all the controversy that came along with that match with him, Six, Kevin, along with Piper and Flair. When Scott returns to the company, uh, how is he different at this time? He's returned, he's back from rehab. Mm, How is he different? You know, he... Was he different? Maybe that's the question. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, yes, he was, but it was subtle. Um, he he didn't have as much of a chip on his shoulder. Um, you know, and I I don't know how many people that you've been around that had substance abuse issues, but it it does change them. You know, it. I, I'm a firm believer, especially the SSRIs and you know the mood altering, brain altering prescriptions that are out there. I firmly believe, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, but I have been around with that stuff a lot. And I've messed around with it myself recreationally, whether it be Adderall or Vicodin or any of those. And I, I do believe that they chemically alter your brain. You know, it, it changes the circuits in some way, shape or form because you see people change dramatically. And I think when Scott, the best way to describe, at least from my memory, the way Scott was when he came out of rehab was he was he was broken. I think his confidence was shaken. Uh, he, he knew he had a serious problem, but I don't think he quite knew how to do it, deal with it. Even though he, you know, he went to rehab, but that was kind of mandatory. There there weren't a lot of options there because Scott was facing some you know serious challenges legally. I don't think Scott really wanted to go to rehab, 
but he knew he had to go to rehab. And when he came out, he was kind of walking on eggshells in a way. It's the only way I can describe it. He wasn't as he wasn't his usual self. And sometimes his usual self was a little obnoxious because his sense of humor, especially when he was using um, his sense of humor, you've been around it, man. You, you've been around a guy in the bar that f- for the first hour or two, he's drinking and he's fun and he's funny and his sense of humor is kind of witty. But after about two hours, it goes from kind of fun and kind of witty to being obnoxious and, and mean. And, you know, that was not unusual for Scott. His sense of humor was dry and he loved to get a reaction out of people and rib them a little bit, but it would go too far occasionally, not all the time. I don't want to make it sound like it was like that all the time. It wasn't. But when he came back, he didn't have that tendency to want to try to engage in humor, whether it was fun and, and entertaining or obnoxious. He, he didn't do that. I think he was trying to be careful. Uh, it's interesting. You mentioned confidence. I think it happens, especially in entertainment um, uh, that I've seen it from is even comedians. I, I don't want to name names, but I, I, I've been with very high profile celebrity stand up comedians uh, and them doing their first show, quote unquote, sober their first time, you know, doing it without drinking before the show or smoking or whatever the case may be. And you see these guys who have had specials, many, many specials, and now they're nervous because they don't have that crutch of a drink in their hand or whatever. Was that the case with him? Maybe, hey, you know, I'm not used to doing this without uh, substances. I, You know, I don't know if that was it. It might have been. Like I said, I'm not an expert. And I, I, you know, as close as I worked with Scott, you know, we weren't real tight personally. So I never dug in. Right. Maybe I should have, I guess, but I, I didn't. I never got personal. It, it stayed professional with me. Um, so I don't know if it was, you know, lack of confidence in terms of his ability in the ring. I don't think Scott Hall ever had any lack of confidence in terms of his performance. I think Scott Hall had a much bigger issue with his performance as just a human being backstage. I think the demons that Scott carried him around kind of, and a little bit of self-loathing as a result made it hard for him backstage. Once he got to the ring, Scott was usually pretty, pretty fine because that's where he was comfortable. He was in control. He had hundred percent confidence in the ring. It's when he got out of the ring is when he got himself into trouble. Well, let's talk about it. Scott and Kevin would take on flair and Piper in Boston on nitro in front of the largest crowd and gate in WCW history. And there were all sorts of problems with cooperation uh, when something like this happens, and I know 1997 is a different time, do you check on Scott? Are you making sure he's in okay, or is there somebody in charge of that? How is that handled? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't engage with Scott while he was in treatment. I wasn't keeping an eye on Scott. Um, Diana Myers, who was an attorney uh, that worked in the WCW office, you know, even though she, she reported to the legal division of Turner Broadcasting. She didn't report directly to me, but she was charged with overseeing WCW along with Nick Lambros. I should take that back. Diana Myers didn't oversee legal in WCW. She assisted, she was an attorney, but she assisted under Nick Lambros who um, oversaw legal in WCW. Um, Diana Myers kind of kept, kept tabs on Scott and then would report to me, but I, I didn't, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to try to reach out to Scott while he was in treatment. My understanding, and I had very limited understanding of what treatment was like back then. I've since learned more because I've had more friends go in, um, but they don't like, they don't like a patient to have a lot of contact outside immediate family while they're in treatment. So I just left it alone. Did you do anything different in terms of managing him regarding alcohol or drugs when he returns? I didn't. I didn't. And again, was that just him or was that anybody that came out of rehab? You don't, you didn't really necessarily treat anybody different. You couldn't. Yeah. Right. Um, No, I I didn't treat him any differently. And and part of that was like, I, you know, I don't want to make him feel conspicuous by his problems. 
and 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 single him out and make him feel uncomfortable any more uncomfortable than one might otherwise feel coming out of treatment and trying to get back into the system so to speak uh so no i didn't treat him any differently at all at the great american bash nash and hall retained the titles over flair and piper when hall pins piper something i've always wanted to know eric when is the idea of someone in the nwo replacing one of the outsiders for matches when they couldn't either work or didn't make it, it's almost like a free bird rule. How is that decided or come up with? You know, there wasn't a formula Cassio. It was okay. Here, here's our situation. Who is, who's the most appropriate in this particular match? You know, it, it wasn't like there was a formula or even much of a debate. Um, and it depended on the situation depended on who the opponents were and, what the promotion was like and where the story was going. If in fact there was a plan for the story to continue forward. Was it just easier to replace people in those matches instead of stripping them of titles? At that point it was, and I'm not a big fan of stripping someone from a title unless it's a storyline. Um, I, I, I never, that was the last resort for me. I would lean into trying to find a creative solution or in this case, a substitute. Let's, uh, let's move to Road Wild 1997. There's a ton of controversy as reported in The Observer. It says, Road Wild was ruined before it ever started. The setting was strike one. The backstage maneuvering, strike two. And the results of that maneuvering, the lame hastily put together finishes up and down the show were strike three. Booker Terry Taylor had put together a show and subsequent bookings for the next couple of months built around three title changes on this show. Chris Jericho to regain the Cruiserweight title from Alex Wright. The Steiners to finally win the tag team titles from Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. And Hulk Hogan to regain the WCW Heavyweight title from Lex Luger. What exactly happened wasn't clear. That be The belief is that Hall and Nash went to Bischoff told him that they thought there had been too many title changes of late and it was ruining the credibility of the titles. At least that's where everyone was placing the blame. On the surface, they have a valid point. Bischoff agreed, which may have been the correct thing to do. The problem was, if that's the case, it needed to have been done before all the plans were made and the fact that it was Hall and Nash who came to the conclusion at the same time they were going to drop the titles does not give the viewpoint something of a conflict of interest. The whole idea beforehand for Hall and Nash to lose those titles was then to put them into singles programs with the Nash Giant program, thought to be a potential big moneymaker. Eric, do you remember this particular time where Scott and Kevin active and talking about plans and overruling finishes and giving advice? Castillo, that's just, it's, it's, it's complete bullshit. That's Dave Meltzer bullshit. And you can always <laughs> tell Dave, Dave Meltzer bullshit because it starts out with, something so obviously wrong and, and, and I mean, just complete bullshit. It's the only way I can say it. Booker Terry Taylor wasn't booking WCW <laughs> Nitro. Well, there's his strike one. He wasn't even booking. He was on the committee. He was a part of the process. He was a part of the team, but he was not booking Nitro or the pay-per-views in 1997. So when, when Dave goes on and on and on and lays out this whole backstage scenario and this guy's in and people are upset and the report is that this and this is it, but he starts out that paragraph or page or whatever it was at the time with something that is so profoundly fucking wrong <laughs> that it's hard not to just want to pull your hair out. Now, speaking of hair, oh, you don't yeah. have to choose between better hair growth and your health. There's a holistic solution. Now, you guys know my hair is the only reason I'm doing this podcast because if it weren't for my head of hair, I would have never gotten an opportunity to get into professional wrestling back in 1990, 1987. I would have never, never risen to the to the levels of success that I did. Were it not for my hair, there's not a lot of talent underneath this hair, folks. But there <laughs> is magnificent hair. And hey, why would you want to choose between healthy hair, healthy body, whole body wellness, right? So you want to get ahead of your thinning hair. Now, believe it or not, my hair is thinning. I, it, mm. it's, it's causing me some concern, which is why I'm glad Nutrafol's a sponsor. 
because you can get ahead of it with no drugs, no compromises. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement, clinically proven to improve your hair growth, thickness, yay, and visible scalp coverage. Now, I got no problem there. My scalp was covered, but the hair's getting a little thin. I'm starting to look like Bernie Sanders. You know, like if I walk into the wind and it's blowing in the right direction because it's all white and shit, it all goes. And I, I got this Bernie Sanders thing going on and I hate it. Now, Nutrafol's hair growth nutraceuticals go beyond genetics to multi target the root causes of thinning hair, including stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, aging, yeah, I get that one, and lifestyle throughout whole body health. Physician formulated using natural medical grade ingredients, Nutrafol's drug-free patented technology, patented technology, folks, provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sexual health. And ain't nobody going to compromise my sexual health. Trust me when I say that. In a clinical study, men show progressive improvement in hair growth and thickness, yay, after three, maybe six months. You need to do this, folks. Nutrafol is trusted and recommended by more than 3,000 top doctors. Aaron, you know, I wish yeah. I would have had this. I do, too. I'm behind now. I feel bad. But, you, hey. There's always hope. And you can grow your thicker, healthier hair, Casio, and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com slash men and entering the promo code 83 weeks to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com slash men spelled n u t r a f o l dot com slash men promo code 83 weeks save the hair eric do you think kevin and scott were hesitant to go back into working singles matches or did they think there was a lot left to do as a tag team and were you pushing for them to get into these singles programs i don't th- oh. It's not like Scott and Kevin were pushing. I think clearly they preferred it. They preferred wrestling as a tag team. Their chemistry was great. They knew each other, obviously, very well um, in the ring. I mean, they were best of friends, but their chemistry inside of the ring was special. And I just think that they probably felt they were better uh, in in a, in in a tag team environment that they were in a singles environment, unless there was a major story or title on the line. That would be my guess. And, and us as fans still loved it. It wasn't like everybody was going, man, we need them broke up. I'm tired of this. No, I mean, they, they, they were still lo- over with everybody. They were still over with everybody in the NWL. And you get to think about it. You know, Scott and Kevin really, Scott was the first guy in the NWO. He started the ball rolling. Kevin jumped in shortly thereafter, and it picked up a lot of steam when Kevin showed up. And not to put myself over, but when he picked me up, power bombed me off the stage in Baltimore, that made a freaking statement. And then obviously that's followed up with Hulk Hogan. So, you know, I think fans kind of recognize Scott and Kevin as, you know, the beginning of the NWO, and that's why they never got tired of him as a tag team. One of the reasons why. Uh, if they've listened to 83 weeks, they know you and Connor had discussed the time that Six was fired for a short time when he pulled Flair's tights down. But it's hard not to give Scott and Kevin credit for sticking up to their friend, right? No, I and listen, that was a, that's one of those situations that you kind of hate being the boss at that point right. because you know you have to do something that deep down inside you don't really want to do it. And you don't really feel it's necessary. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you got bosses and shit and – when your bosses and shit think you need to take action, then you you have to take action. I didn't really want to. And I think I may have even told Scott or Sean, don't worry about it. I'm going to do what I got to do. Just take a breath. Take a little time off. We'll see you. We'll see you shortly. Um, but no, I was, I was forced into that. And I look, I respected Scott and, and Kevin. I mean, you know, I was frustrated with Sean because he knew better. You know, he, we were having issues with with higher ups and Turner uh, about nudity and language and 
you know, we're being asked relatively nicely to clean up our own act and police our own stuff. And I didn't want that to change. I didn't want to keep pushing that envelope and, and, and getting that phone call Monday morning from my boss or my boss's boss inside of Turner Broadcasting um, because we kept doing stupid shit over and over again. So I was, I was, I was perturbed, but not, not to the point where I wanted to fire him. Did, did he, you said you approached him that way. Did he understand that? I mean, I, I know he wasn't excited about it, but did he see where you Yeah, I, you know, I don't remember his, in fact, I don't even know if I'm the one to call him and told him or, or and I know I did talk to him afterwards, but I, it might've been Nick Lambros perhaps that had to make the call and let him know. Um, I'm sure he was pissed. I'm sure he was, but you know, Sean was a little, you know, Sean has really calmed down. He's matured a lot. He's cleaned up his act. Uh, doesn't have a, you know, any recreational activity challenges anymore. Um, but at the time he was a little bit of a hothead. He could be a pain in the ass and he was under, <laughs> he was under a lot of bad influence, you know, between Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, you know, it, it wasn't hard to kind of step out, step out of bounds every now and then, <laughs> because that was the nature of how they lived uh, at WCW. Uh, you recently discussed Fall Brawl 97, so everyone be sure to check that out in the archives of 83 Weeks. But this is really the launching point of the Scott Hall, Larry Zabisco program. What, why Larry Z for Scott? Uh, they, you know, the, chemistry, first and foremost. Uh, Scott had a lot of respect for Larry, and they went back a long time. Um, but I think, you know, respect chemistry and i had a lot of confidence in larry larry you know larry was larry's career was clearly getting into the sunset provision <laughs> um you know he, he was winding down his in-ring in career he was, he was a great color commentator and i really enjoyed working with larry in, in color commentary but um that was that part of his career was winding down the in-ring portion of it but he still even though you know larry wasn't an active wrestler in the ring on a week-to-week -week basis he was still very very good and i loved his style of wrestling and i was confident that because of the chemistry and the history between the two they could have you know they could have some great matches and some great interaction on the microphone the end of september 97 nash hurts his knee scott has a bad back but scott keeps working singles matches and has his infamous loss over hector garza where he gave him nothing but lost to a schoolboy. Where do you think that creative came from? Is that a Kevin Sullivan? And do you think Garza got anything out of it? I don't think Garza got anything out of it. And I think it was just frustration, just sheer frustration. No, uh, that, Kevin Sullivan? that sounds to me, you know, I don't remember the details on that one. That sounds to me though, as you described it as just kind of making a statement. Yeah, I'll do the job because you want me to do the job, but I don't really want to do the job, so I'm just going to go through the motions. That's right. what that sounds like to me. Meltzer would speculate that the working plan in October for Starcade is that Hall and Nash will screw up interference to lead to Sting beating Hulk, and the splinter in the NWO will be a big focus in 98 with Hall and Nash on one side and Hulk on another was the original plan before Bret Hart became available? Was this the original plan? No, I don't know where that came from. Really? I honestly don't, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, when I hear these, these kind of reports from back in the day, as they're read to me, first of all, they're so fucking absurd that sometimes I end up just shutting them down and don't listen to the end because it's just hard for me. Um, but I also think that Dave was probably talking to some people, perhaps some that were on the booking committee or one in particular on the booking committee. And the only reason I'm not going to drop a name is because I don't know for sure. And I don't want to accuse somebody of doing something they didn't do. That's a shitty thing to do. But my guess is, you know, Meltzer probably is talking to some disenfranchised kind of frustrated members of the booking committee that weren't getting their way. You know, and that happens a lot of times. It, well, it did in WCW because you get a bunch of people in a room that have strong personalities and all have experience and are, you know, they're, they're alphas, you know, everybody in there is pretty aggressive. 
how they ended up in the wrestling business in the first place. And then you sit around a room and you, you collaborate sometimes, um, you know, you've ever heard the saying, there's no such thing as a bad idea. That's a lie. There are bad ideas. <laughs> and, and sometimes if you're passionate about an idea and you push it, you push it and push it, but nobody else sees it. You walk out of that room kind of pissed off, frustrated. It's, I guess, human. It's unprofessional as hell. And people that have that tendency don't usually last very long in a creative environment because nobody wants to work with that for very long, but too often individuals like that, whether they were part of the booking committee or they're just on a roster when they're not getting the push they want, when they're not getting any attention when they want, when no one's taking the ideas that they're putting out and pitching. Oh, what do we do? We call Dave Meltzer. We bitch about it. So Dave Meltzer writes about it so that people that are running the company will look at it and go, Oh, oh maybe, maybe I should make a change in the way I do things. That's, that happened. I saw it happen. I saw that type of thing happen when I was in WCW before I got into management. When a guy by the name of Jeff Carr, Jeff Carr was a nice, decent guy. He was a good guy, but he was a program director, program director on TBS. And he was a wrestling fan. Now, so, you know, program directors are their management, but they're lower, lower level management. Uh, and they report on up the food chain, but their job is to kind of just keep tabs and keep track of all the different programs that are on the network and deal with any of the issues that result, you know, to the network from those shows, whether it be promotion or trafficking, meaning commercials or whatever. Um, that was Jeff Carr. And like I said, Jeff Carr was a, was a great guy. I liked Jeff, but he was a bit of a nerd. I'm trying to put it, <laughs> clearly but as nicely as i can and J jeff card never came to any of the wrestling events jeff card never showed up to my knowledge he may have been to one or two but to my knowledge jeff card was never present at any of our pay-per-views from the time i started in wcw 91 all the way up until the time i left jeff card was never in the wcw offices he was not a part of any of our meetings he was not a part of our creative he wasn't a part of any operational facet of wcw and i say this only to make a point that although Jeff was not part of WCW in any way, shape or form, he worked for Turner Broadcasting, but he was a wrestling fan. Like he was the biggest wrestling fan in the world. Like he read the dirt sheets and he could tell you who beat who in 1968 and you know, what one wrestler liked for dinner. I mean, he knew all of it, right? All the trivia, he could tell you everything. And as such, people within Turner Broadcasting, not within WCW, keep in mind, when I describe this scenario to you, there was Turner Broadcasting and there was WCW, which was a division of Turner Broadcasting. And in TBS, the network, you know, was its own operational unit. Um, God, I just got lost. What was I trying to illustrate? Help me out here. What were we talking about? Uh, we we were talking about uh, guys uh, pitching. Oh, okay. Ideas. I know. I know where I was. Okay, sorry, I got off track. I got ahead of myself in my brain. <laughs> but but Jeff Carr, as a pro program programming um, director for WTBS, the, the TBS the network, because he was such a wrestling fan, everybody in TBS knew that Jeff Carr was a wrestling fan. So they would just go to Jeff Carr for opinions. If they had a question about what WCW was doing, or there was an issue within WCW content, the television show itself, nobody would pick up the phone and call someone in WCW, whether it was Dusty Rhodes when he was in creative or Jim Hurd when he was overseeing things or Bill Watts when he was overseeing things. No, there was never a direct line of communication between TBS, the, the network and WCW. It would go from whatever executive inside of TBS had an issue to Jeff Carr because he was the wrestling expert because he he read the dirt sheets and he knew everything that the dirt sheets thought they do. So oftentimes guys in the talent in WCW and sometimes people in management, very rarely though, would say things to Dave Meltzer privately that they knew would end up in the dirt sheet that they knew Jeff Carr would be reading 
with the hopes that somehow Jeff Carr, because he was TBS, um, would influence WCW decisions. I don't know if that made any sense to you because it's kind of a, a, a weird tangled web of manipulation and, and dishonesty, but that, that happened. So to summarize it, you would have talent that was frustrated. They knew that at that time, you know, when I got there in 91, 92, 93, 94, uh, for that period of time, the people in charge of WTBS, uh, there was one guy that really read the dirt sheets, and that was Jeff Carr, and he had a tremendous amount of influence from time to time whenever there were issues in WCW. And uh, so oftentimes the talent would feed things to Dave that they knew would end up in the dirt sheet, hoping that it would somehow benefit them. It's probably the reason why I have such a, uh, a an embedded hostility to dirt sheets and the people that write them because they don't realize the adverse effect that that can have on the business. You know, every, you know these guys all purport to love the business. They just love the business, but yet they report, um, lies as fact they distort and i i it it does have an adverse effect on the business at some point by the way our our crack team uh, found his linkedin and jeff carr had that job from 87 to 2018 that's a long run wow that's a long run all right, let's uh, let's talk about Jim Cornette. He is negative towards WCW on the WWF online show. Bite this regarding the NWO parody on Arn Anderson. He would have to have this to say regarding the talent. And by the way, going in, I'm going to do my best to read jo Jim Cornette. This is very difficult to do for me. <laughs> is he worse than trying to read Dave Meltzer? Because honestly, <laughs> reading Dave Meltzer, when, when, when Conrad or you, as you just did, start reading this stuff back to me, I, I get, start to get fucking vertigo. <laughs> okay. I really do. It's like I'm going to fall. On, I'm sitting in my chair, but I'm going to fall on my face. Just listening to this because I get vertigo. But go ahead, let's both. Do he our sets best. everything up. He ends, of course, uh, getting uh, talking about uh, you for a little bit. So here we go. This is Cornette. I'm going to say this right out front. I mean every word I'm saying, and I don't care who knows it. It shows how little taste and how little class that that whole promotion has to begin with to do a parody of that interview. But I'm not surprised because of the quality of human beings that are involved. As far as the whole group of them goes. Conan didn't draw money if you dipped him in glue and drug him through Fort Knox. Bagwell. That's a good, that's a good, you got to hand him that one. That was a good one. <laughs> no, he's a wordsmith. Bagwell, he says, I don't know. Maybe he was just trying to keep his job, but Nash, Hall, and Six, I guess he's named after his IQ or the number of brain cells he has left. You know, all the fans think that these guys are so cool and they're so sweet. They got the easiest jobs in the world. All they got to do is go out there and be themselves, childish, obnoxious, adolescent, smart asses with a bad case of arrested emotional development and a fixation on trying to act macho. In my opinion, Kevin Nash is one of the biggest no talents that ever stepped in the ring in this business. He's got six moves, no ability, and his one talent is that he has enough timing to cover up for some of it. He got into this business because of accidental genetics and because he had a multi-million dollar promotion push him to the moon to make him a star. Then he leaves that promotion, the WWF, after giving his word that he was staying. So he's a liar too. He's had one good match in his career and he had to pull a guy's wooden leg off to do that. He's made his entire living out of being a backstage manipulator. As far as Scott Hall goes, Scott Hall's a good wrestler. Good's about it, but he's the best of the bunch. He had the same multi-million dollar promotional company making him a star after he'd been in the business close to 10 years without putting three asses in a seat. As a human being, he's about the quality as Nash is in terms of honesty and or integrity, which means if they tell you the sun is going to come up tomorrow, go out and buy a flashlight, you're going to need it. As far as six goes, he had a job because he carries the other guy's bags and they think he's cute when he gets drunk and throws up on himself. And that's the entire reason he's employed. 
He has the distinction of being, uh, in case anyone hasn't noticed, the only guy on either side of the wrestling war to have been released from a valid wrestling contract to go and join the other side, which shows how valuable he is. The only reason the NWO guys are in the position that they are in right now is because Eric Bischoff, even more than being a mark for his own face and voice, is a mark for hanging out with studly guys with long hair that smoke cigars and ride Harleys. So maybe some of that can rub off on his little pansy ass frame. So he throws a billionaire's money around to prove that his Johnson is bigger than the guys who put their own money on the line. A lot to digest there, Eric. Where would you like to start? First of all, let me say I love listening to Jim Cornette rant <laughs> <laughs> because he is good at it. I mean, unlike Meltzer, who is like this fucking giant word salad, Cornette, like when he goes off on a rant, is actually pretty funny. He it's says some incredible. pretty good shit. Um, but look, you know, he, he, I, I don't dislike Jim. I, I really don't. He's uh, oftentimes I read and hear things that he says. I think I probably agree with him on the product itself and, and things like psychology. I probably agree with Jim more than I don't. Now, his opinions about people and individuals and things that he really knows nothing about, which is the case here. Jim never worked with me. Jim and I were in the same company in WCW for a minute. And subsequent to that, we had a couple of interactions that were very memorable for him. I, I didn't even remember until he brought them up, to be honest. And Jim has never really accomplished anything in the professional wrestling now business. Now he was a, he was a good talent. Oh, some people may think he was a great talent. Okay. That's subjective, whatever. Some people may think he was one of the best managers, you know, ever in, 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 in his era. Okay. I'll give him that too. I, I don't think so, but other people do. And like I say, it's subjective, but beyond being in the business and benefiting financially from being in the business, Jim Cornette has never done anything that improved the business. He benefited from it and he attempted to have his own wrestling promotion. It didn't work out, but it, it, listen, the odds of that being successful are pretty slim. So I'm not being critical. That's just a fact. You know, the one time that he had his own promotion, he, it ran for a while until it didn't. Um, but beyond Smoky Mountain Wrestling and that foray into actually creating a, a wrestling company, what has Jim Cornette ever contributed to the business? Not partaken in, in the business. I don't want to hear about the great matches he was in because that's benefiting from the wrestling business, that opportunity and the money that comes with it. The position that he had in, in WWE at the time that he, he conducted this interview. Those are all benefits of being in the industry, but what has he contributed? What, what is something that we see today that you can trace back to something that Jim Cornette innovated or contributed? The answer is fucking nothing. This is a guy who still to this day, by virtue of his gifted uh, use of the English language and his, his sense of humor and his personality and his wit uh, and his intelligence, because he's a very smart guy, um, he's still in the business today and relevant in his way today because he benefited from being in the wrestling business. But what has he contributed to the wrestling business? The answer is fucking nothing. And that's why when I hear things like this out of Jim, between the fact that half the time I laugh at it because it is really entertaining, and the other half I realize he's just another bitter, frustrated guy that, you know, was in the wrestling business and at and, and a very high level at one point that never really contributed to, any, to the business itself, but yet is really quick to criticize those who have. So in short, let me just summarize, Your Honor. <laughs> I don't give a fuck what Jim Cornette says. I don't hate Jim Cornette. But I'll tell you about somebody I do hate. I hate friggin' Steven Singer, yep. Oh, no. I hate that Steven Singer guy. He <laughs> makes getting the perfect engagement ring for that special someone so easy, unlike other jewelers. Steven doesn't mark his jewelry way up just to mark it down and make you feel like you're getting a deal. I hate that, man. That's shady as hell. No phony sales, no coupons, no discounts, no pricing games. Just 
the perfect price, which offers the very best value at the very best possible price every single day. That's why other jewelers hate Steven Singer. Steven Singer focuses on what really matters, love. That's right, I say love. <laughs> I just have fun saying love. <laughs> Steven isn't in the jewelry business, man. He's in the love business. And Steven also stands by his jewelry with the best guarantee in the business with his unbeatable 100-day, 100% money-back guarantee, plus fast and free shipping both ways. No other jeweler has a better return policy or better guarantees. And that's why you can trust Steven Singer online at IHateStevenSinger.com in his showroom at the corner, or I should have said, or in his showroom at the corner of 8th and Walnut in Philly. Buy diamonds from a real jewel jeweler you can trust, Steven Singer Jewelers. And this is my favorite part of doing these Steven Singer ads. I hate Steven Singer.com. How was that for a read? That was strong. <laughs> it was fun I, too. I was enjoying it for real. So um, was I. Could you tell? Maybe a little yeah. too much. I was no. That was a good one. I like it. I like it. Uh, do you also like hanging out with studly guys with long hair that smoke cigars and ride Harleys? Um. <laughs> again, you know, I don't know. I mean, look, I've been. Oh, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, by the way, who would say no to that, right? <laughs> But it, it, this is something again that that you know Cornette and 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 in the others that you know tried to live in that narrative and and took joy in that narrative. Um, I I've been riding motorcycles since I was fourteen. I haven't not had a motorcycle since I was, uh, if you can call a mini bike a motorcycle, since I was eight, and I've ridden Harley's all my life. Um, it's certainly not the biggest part of my life, but. Yeah, I'll I'll hang out. I get a phone call from some buddies, and they happen to have long hair. And if once in a while they smoke a cigar, and they want to go for a ride. Hell yeah! <laughs> but uh, I don't seek it out. So again, it's just it's just jealous kind of bullshit. High school like <laughs> bullshit. None of it's true. Well, we go from an entertaining word salad to a boring plain word salad. We're gonna go back to the observer and you can guess where Meltzer would get this next part from Eric. That's, that's going right, to be the game. That. We get this to the end. Turn this into like a game show. <laughs> we get to the end. You guess who gave him this. All right. The situation with hall was kind of strange. And there was an argument before nitro on nine 22 in West Valley city, Utah between he and WCW promoter Zane Brezloff about the short and generally unsatisfactory main events with all the big houses at the arenas of late. Then Hall came down with a bad back, although those close to him say he had been complaining of the back injury over the weekend and showed up for the weekend shows on crutches. Who said that to him, you think? Mm, Zane Bresloff did talk to Dave on a pretty regular basis, and Zane was the promoter, and Zane would be the person that would be most affected by an issue, you know, in the live event side of things where we weren't okay. producing television. So I, I mean, and I, and look, I, I was aware that Zane and, and Dave were friends. I didn't have an issue with that. Um, and that sounds like something that Zane might've said, just venting a little bit. Um, I will say as I was listening to that and I right away, I pretty much just, I would assume it was Zane Breslau, but what's inconsistent about the whole thing is when you, when you hear it and I listen to it, it made it sound like, you know, oh, Scott's just being lazy. He doesn't want to work a main event. Just wants to go home. Wants to get to the bar. Let's just cut this short. Scott took a lot of pride in his work. He, and I'm not saying there weren't times when, there were issues that resulted out of Scott's behavior in the ring, but Scott would never go out in my opinion, go out and intentionally have a shitty main event 
because he took too much pride in his work. I would, I, I would, I would lean into, I hate the fact that I'm saying lean into, because everybody's saying it now. And here I am leaning into, <laughs> leaning into, and I fucking hate it. I'm not going to do it anymore. No more leaning into anything. Embrace it. Lean into it. I'm going to lean into a six pack and a pizza tonight. <laughs> I'm watching Sunday night football, but that's the only lean in I'm going to do from now on. But I would believe in my heart of hearts that Scott did have an issue with his back. And it's a little hard to go out there and have a 20 minute barn burner or 30 minute barn burner main event. If you've got a bad back, anybody that's ever had a bad back knows it can be tough just getting up and down from a chair, more or less going out and performing in a wrestling ring. So when I combine the fact that Scott did have back issues, lower back issues, and the fact that he took so much pride in his work, there may have been an issue in those live events that Zane was frustrated with, but I wouldn't just automatically assume it was because of Scott's behavior or unwillingness to, to work with that local promoter. Do you think Scott would um, be the kind to overdo it so much to overdo the show so much to show up on crutches when not needed. Oh. Seems like a big commitment to the fake story. The if it is a fake story. Yeah. I, I just don't. Yeah. Man, I just don't. Um, from the uh, October nitro 10, six Scott Hall pinned Hector Garza in 153 with the edge in a match where he mockingly faked a back injury as a spoof since everyone figured he was faking his injury the past two weeks anyway. Now that I believe. That, <laughs> that, that, she, that, that's what I believe. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't give Garza any of offense. Uh, after the match, he spray-painted Z on the ref, who was made to act like a total scared rabbit. There was some internal heat because Hall and Nash didn't do television angles to explain their injuries at a, as everyone else has done. Where do you think the quote internal heat came from Terry Taylor? Hard to say on that one. Gary Jester was another one that was famous for talking to Meltzer. That. I, I, if I had to put money on that one, I'd put money. I'd put money on, on Gary Jester. Ooh. Okay. Hall and six would drop the tag team titles to the Steiners and six will get hurt in this match on nitro and never wrestle for WCW again. Kind of crazy looking back at that now, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, he was off for a while and you know, I mean, I didn't fire Sean because of um, the back injury, obviously um, it was because of a contractual I issue and some uh, pretty shitty games. His, manager was playing at the time where I had negotiated an agreement with Sean. He was operating under that agreement. I was paying him according to that agreement all while we were getting it formalized. And, and we're talking over a period of probably a month or two, maybe longer, not really sure. Um, there was some feet dragging on probably both sides. Uh, in terms of finalizing an agreement that does happen in business. And I get, it happens to me still to this day, when you're dealing with big companies, it takes forever to get final agreements sometimes. So I'm not blaming any one person for it, but it existed. And then at some point in time, I got a phone call from Sean Waltman's manager who said, eh, Sean wants to renegotiate the deal. We already had renegotiated and I've been paying him under. <laughs> That's when I fired him. Is the practice of uh, letting him wrestle and working under the quote new agreement. Was that something you did with other wrestlers as well? I may have, okay. you know, I mean, look, that wasn't there's... completely out of the ordinary. No, it wasn't completely. I mean, again, because of timing, if you, if you agree to a letter of intent, which just basically lays out the, the deal points you, you know what the money is, you know what the dates are, you know what the term is, you know, all the basic, you know, ingredients of the agreement and everybody signs that letter of intent with a letter of intent, even though it's not legally binding, unless it's a binding letter of intent and is, is noticed as such in the document. But if you sign a letter of intent and it's obvious, 
I generally trust people enough to live up to the word. And, and that's what pissed me off about this situation. And it wasn't even Sean Waltman as much as it was his dipshit manager. Um, it just, it just pissed me off. It's just not the way to do business. And I took it out on Sean, which was unfortunate, but I did. Um, but no, I've, I, you know, I, I would do it because again, sometimes it, you, you sign that letter of intent, everybody, parties agree, you know, what are you going to do? Not, not work somebody, not use somebody for a period of a week or two or three and not know when they're going to exactly come back to work because you have to wait till you get the final legal document. I, I didn't believe I had to work that way. I believe if I had a letter of intent, I basically trusted the parties involved. And once I start paying that individual under the terms of the letter of intent that they signed, ultimately, if you end up in front of a judge and a judge is looking at the fact that you did agree to the basic terms of the agreement and the employer, in this case, WCW was paying you under those new terms. You had in effect a meeting of the minds, which is a legal definition of a contract. So even, even though I would do it and it's a little risky and I'm sure there are other people, maybe even today, nobody would do that. I don't know. I don't think that's the case. I think it still happens today, but legally, if it comes down to it, even with a letter of intent and without a formal contract, as long as I'm up op operating under the terms of the new agreement, um, the talent is expected to. So do you remember it, if, go ahead. Do you remember if that manager had other wrestlers as his client? Oh yeah. That's part of the reason it pissed me off as much as it did. It was Barry Bloom, <laughs> by the way. I'm not trying to keep his name out of the prayer. It was Barry Bloom. He knows I think he's a piece of shit. Um, I've been pretty vocal about that, the way he conducted business with WCW. Uh, and I'm sure there are people in WWE that would agree with me wholeheartedly that have had to work with him. At Halloween Havoc 1997, Luger and Hall faced off. Lex Luger beat Scott Hall in 13.02 total time with Larry Zbysko as referee. This wasn't much of a match. Luger didn't do a thing, and Hall just did just enough to keep the match going as it was really just a backdrop to working with Zbysko. Hall did a few moves and got two counts, and yelled about the slow counts. The two started arguing, and at one point, Hall charged at Zabisco, who backdropped him over the top rope. Bischoff came out, and Zabisco kicked him off the apron. They teased the double count out. They excuse me. They teased the double count out, but both made it in on time. And Luger kept giving Hall those reverse atomic knee drops that are sold like crotch shots, so actually miss by a lot. As Bischoff distracted Zabisco. Six kicked Luger in the head, that whiffed as well, and Zabisco turned around and very slowly counted three. Zabisco was mad about Hall winning and said he wanted to watch the replay on the video wall. This should set a nice precedent since all referees being confused about finishes on TV shoots should do the same. Seeing the outside interference, he ordered the match restarted. Six then attacked Zabisco, but Zabisco was on the bottom doing his jujitsu. Of course, that term can't be used, although they tried to portray Zabisco's submissions as being learned from Gene LaBelle, which, since he was a pro wrestler in the 1960s, I guess is the name they're allowed to use for shoot moves. It says trying an arm bar and then clamping on a front guillotine, which Six sold as if his neck was rebroken. Hall and Zabisco then argued. Zabisco shoved Hall and was picked up in Luger's torture rack for the submission 20 seconds after the restart. Hall and Bischoff then attacked Zabisco after the match, and Zabisco kicked him in the head and then gave him a stomp worthy of a green valet on an independent show and stood over him while Hall counted as Bischoff stepped on Zabisco's chest three-quarter stars. Well, Eric, that reads like a mess, and it is a mess if you go back and watch it. Is this one of those things that just didn't work? No, it worked. It did that work. Worked. It was, was it a, you know, one of the marquee matches of the year? Is it a Dave Meltzer four star match? No, it wasn't. <laughs> did it advance the story and set up a feud and get people pissed off? Yes, it did. Therefore it worked. It's that simple. All right. From Nitro. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's, Go that's ahead. it. That's this. That's the sum up though. Yeah. The story continued. We got to get to the end of the story somehow, and it proceeded exactly how y'all wanted it to go. Uh, from Nitro 11397, Scott Hall came out wearing a tag title, 
I guess the angle is that Hall and Nash are going to proclaim themselves as the real tag champs since they never lost the titles and bought themselves belts. Hall then lost to Jericho uh, clean in 241 of a good surprise finish and then beat him up after the match. Seems like we just saw that angle with Hector Garza. Larry Zabisco made the save and challenged Hall to a match, but of course Hall didn't accept. This has always been looked back on as a big win for Jericho, but he, he is really the body who Scott lost to. Was this an attempt to make another one, two, three kid moment? I don't think it was in a, I don't think consciously anybody was going, okay, let's, we got Jericho here. Oh, look what they did with one, two, three kid and what Scott Hall did. I don't think it was con, at least, I don't think it was a conscious effort, certainly not on my part. Um, did Scott Hall kind of go back to the well and do something that, and suggest doing something that had worked really well previously? It's entirely possible. Doesn't make it a bad move, does it? And by the way, how did Chris Jericho do? I think Pretty he good. did okay. Pretty good. Yeah. So maybe it was the right thing to do. Maybe Chris Jericho owes his career to to Scott Hall. Who knows? Ooh, how about that? Maybe you have, you know, one, two, three kid, the surprise win that he got in WWE, which really put one, two, three kid on the map. And perhaps Scott went back to the well and said, hey, it worked so well with one, two, three kid. Let's do it again with Chris Jericho. That could have happened. And if it did happen, guess what? It fucking worked. So good on you, Scott. Yeah. And fuck I, you. And fuck you, Dave Meltzer. <laughs> I seem to think whoever the body is, if you get a win over Scott Hall, it's a big win. I mean, I, whatever the storyline is, it's a big win for you. Well, and especially because, in, you know, Dave just pointed out, it was unexpected. Anytime you do something the audience doesn't expect, they remember it. Yep. For God's sake. If you keep doing the same shit they see all the time over and over and over and over and over again, they don't remember it. So maybe the shock value of that win was precisely what they felt when I say they, meaning Scott Hall and probably Kevin Sullivan, maybe myself. I may have been involved in that conversation. I don't remember. Fuck, it was 25 years ago. It was a quarter of a century ago. <laughs> Mucker Fathers. How many of you remembered what you did at work 25 years ago? <laughs> I don't remember yesterday. So. I don't either. Oh, well, I do, but barely. <laughs> what about, do you remember the report uh, about Nash and Hall actually having tag belts made up for themselves? Is that part true? I, I, I don't know. It could have been. Okay. It sounds like something they would do. It would be in their character to, to, to pull a stunt like that. So I'm, I'm, I'll just suggest that probably happened. At World War III in 1997, Hall does get the victory to earn a future title shot. Is this to set him up as the first opponent for Sting? When was this? 97, World War III. World War III, and that's in September, right? Can't remember. God, it's been a long time. Fuck, man, I can't remember. I wish I could. But I November 23rd, 1997, Palace of Auburn Hills. Give me the setup again one more time. Uh, Hall gets a victory to earn a future title shot. Was that on purpose to set him up as the first opponent for Sting? I don't think so. Could be. Was it just but to get him a title shot no matter who it was? It's just to advance it, just to advance okay. Scott Hall, just to put a little steam on Scott individually. I, I don't think we were trying to set up a Sting Hall match at that point, but I, I could be wrong. Could be All wrong. right, it's also speculated the observer that the rules of the Battle Royal were changed because some guys didn't want to take a bump over the top rope, and so far they could have, excuse me, so far they could be eliminated just by their feet hitting the floor. Is that why? I don't know. That's, you remember changing it's, it's the rules? So hard to, it's so hard to comment on some of that reporting because hey, sometimes it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's usually no aspect of it was true. So when I end up saying, God, I don't remember that, it's not that my memory's bad. It's just that it never fucking happened that way, which is why I don't remember it. You don't remember guys complaining about going over the top rope? Oh, I've never heard a complaint about anybody okay. going over the top rope. I've never had one person... No, I don't even have to say, I don't even have to, to qualify it. I have never had one person that was scheduled to be in the battle royal come to me and say, Eric, 
pretty please. I don't really like going over the top rope. So could you change the rules for me? Uh -uh. Never Let happened. Me just touch, please. All right. Scott Hall is not scheduled for a match at Starcade, but he's the current number one contender to the WCW title and also feuding with an announcer, Larry Zabisco, that you'll be wrestling at Starcade. Did Scott have any issues with not wrestling or was he content not having to bump? Oh, see, I, uh, <sighs> was that just how the story played out at that? No, time? it's how the story played out. And so how the story was intended to play out, but it's the last little bit. Was he content just not to bump? Scott was a bumping motherfucker, man. <laughs> he took, he took a lot of pride in his work. You know, when I was doing the interview yesterday for a and &E, the guy was that was producing it, you know, he said, what do you think Scott's legacy will be? And, you know, legacy is a big word, right? And I said, I don't know what it will be. I know what I hope it will be. And it will be his body of work. Because Scott was one of the best there is of guys his size in terms of his ability on the mic, his ability in the ring. He was fluid. He was one of the best you know, during the peak of his career and had some amazing matches. And that to me is what I hope his legacy will be. But unfortunately, because of the dirt sheets and the people that live in the dirt sheet universe, there was this narrative out there that he was lazy and he didn't want to work. And that's so untrue or that he didn't want to bump, go back and watch some of his, he was a bumping son of a bitch and he was a big man. People don't, you know, they forget how big Scott Hall was because they saw him standing next to Kevin Nash so often. But when you met Scott Hall, when you stood next to Scott Hall, you were still, you, you were standing next to a man and you knew it, but he would still go out there and bump like crazy. So whenever I hear that inference that you know, Scott just was, you know, didn't want to work any more than was necessary, didn't want to take a bump, it's just not true. It's funny as a, as a fan, the first time I saw Scott Hall in person, he is one of those guys where you go, Holy shit. Who, who, first of all, who is that walking in the door? And then you go, Oh, it's Scott Hall. He's huge. It's like you said though, we had saw him, me as a fan, watching him on TV next to Nash. You, you know, it's like a foot NFL player. You forget how big these guys are because you see them all across the board, the same shape and size. They're giant humans. Giant and, and scary, like Michael Myers sure is scary. But the last thing you need to do is to be hairy this Halloween, like really hairy, <laughs> right? Now, luckily, our friends at Manscaped launched their fourth generation performance package to make sure that your pumpkins get the ultimate carving experience on this spooky <laughs> day. I love this stuff. I absolutely love Manscaped. Turn your Bite-sized treat into a king-sized candy enjoyed 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off. Free shipping with the code 83 weeks. Make the right call this spooky season. It's trick or trim. I love this. And I love Manscaped. Oh, come on. Right. Say, it, say it louder for those in the back, Eric. Get it. I love me some Manscaped. I do. It's it's the Go greatest ahead, ball trimmer on the planet. That's that's the fact. It is. And and I tried, you know, like, oh, I don't know, it was maybe 15 years ago or so. I thought, man, it's kind of like a fucking jungle down there. I need to fix this. I got to trim it up a little bit. So you get scissors out there. Start, start out with the scissors. You're doing a little trim in, right? And then it's, you know, to the razor. I thought, well, this is not bad. And like the first time I did it, it was like, oh, man, this is scary. It's like performing surgery on yourself, right? And it's a little, you know, a little tender down there. So, you know, oh, man, that's going okay. I got shaving cream all over my crotch and I'm trying to shave it up. And then sure enough, bam. And, of course, I was in the shower when it, when it happened, right? And all of a sudden, it looked like somebody was gutting a goat in my bathtub while I was in the shower. <laughs> a, it is a Michael Myers movie. It was a mess. <laughs> so that's why I love me some manscape and 
I'm sure a lot of people out there have tried to trim your balls and it ends up looking like a Freddy Krueger movie, right? Well, <laughs> luckily Manscaped is here to save the day and make sure you're feeling your best in your costume. Unlock your confidence with the Performance Package 4.0. I love this one, too. You'll get the holy grail of men's grooming items. They're Come made on. easy. It's it made it easy for you to upgrade. For your grooming routine if it's a full moon out there and you got a werewolf in your pants it's time to tackle the problem with the lawnmower 4.0 they're finely tuned pube products feature cutting edge ceramic blade to re reduce grooming accidents like the one i had when it looked like i gutted a goat in the shower <laughs> thanks to their advanced skin safe technology the lawnmower 4.0 is easily the greatest ball trimmer on the planet and oh did i mention it's waterproof. Come on. So you can use it in the shower. It's awesome. Now, Cassio, you were there when we did the uh, flare roast, right? Yes. And I decided to open up my my little thing talking you about You went Anthony. full blown. Full blown. Yeah. I was shaving my balls and my ass yeah. and everything, you know, on stage in front of the world on flight TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what'll happen with a couple of beers in me, isn't it? Think about but that I talked sentence. about it, but I, I worked shaved it. my balls live on Friday. I did. <laughs> and I didn't even get paid for it. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but I talked a little bit about the, the, the weed whacker because it's a nose and hair, you know, nose hair and ear hair trimmer. And I was so excited about that. And I told him the story because it was true. I went to the barber one time. And I was going, oh man, it's taking forever to cut my hair until I realized he was spending all of his time trimming the hair in my ears and, you know i got home and i'm looking I'm going, what the fuck yeah and of course my eyes are bad i didn't realize it i got hair growing in my ears i looked up my nose and said, oh my god so i i use that man i use the weed whacker all the time seal the deal with manscaped's liquid formulations the crop preserver ball deodorant and the crop and? Re reviver ball yeah, deodorant yeah. to make sure your pumpkins stay fresh trust me I when i say I this I was Ahead, I wish man. I had before and afters in my pumpkins. I've been using the ball toner. They are, they're toned, baby. That's the only thing toned on this body is the balls. Thanks to the crop reviver. I haven't tried that yet. Come you on, man. It? Come on. Yeah. Yes. Your balls will thank you, Eric. My wife might too. <laughs> Well, let's do this, man. You know, Cassio and I, the whole team, we love Manscaped, and you can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code 83weeks at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code 83weeks at manscaped.com. Say trick or treat or trick or trim to your beautiful new Halloweeny <laughs> with Manscaped. I couldn't wait to do this. This is so much fun. I never expected to look across and see Eric Bischoff say Halloweeny to me today, and I appreciate it. Doesn't it put you in the mood, though? I'm Halloween? here for it, buddy. I'm here for it. All right. So does how does Big Booty Judy feel about your tone ball? She all good with that? Uh, I'm waiting to see uh, when she notices. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll give a full report. It's uh, taken longer than I thought. So they must not be, they must have been really needed uh, reviving because uh, I thought they've come back to life a little bit. They look good. To me, they look good, but I see them more than her. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh. Uh, <laughs> Before Starcade, it's reported that Hall and Nash had signed four year contract extensions to lock them up until 2003. The reality is on January 1st, 1997, Hall signed a four-year deal that would expire on December 31st, 2001. Did Hall or Barry Bloom ever come up with, uh, come up after the contract was signed to renegotiate or was Hall content from a contract point of view? Wow. There are bits and pieces of that that ring a bell but again doubt that it's true we weren't signing people that long i mean we do typically two-year deals occasionally a three-year deal i don't know that we've ever we ever did a four-year deal or okay. four-year extension that would that would be really really unusual so based on the fact that we never 
previously. There was no precedent for four-year extensions or four-year contracts for that matter. Three years was the limit. Um, I find that report to be bullshit. <laughs> do you all right? Look, do you think January first, ninety seven? Do you think Hall signed two, maybe three years though? Uh, I came in at ninety six, but I could see a two year. I could okay. see possibly a three year discussion at that time uh, because uh, so I was yeah. trying to I was trying to create some parity because it, we had an issue, and you know. You, we've we've kind of all been, been made aware of the issue that AEW had when you had talent that were under contract and you bring some other b- big names in. And of course you've got to pay them commensurate with what they had earned in the past in order to attract them. Well, that creates an immediate disparity between, you know, the new talent that's coming in and talent that have been working with you for a year or two or three or in WCW case, cases, sometimes longer. So when that started happening and it did create some issues in an effort to try to mitigate those issues, I was open to renegotiating some contracts, uh, particularly for people that were um, generating the money and creating the revenue, uh, much like Tony Khan apparently has with MJF. You know, it was the right thing to do. And I, it's unfortunate that it all went down the way it went down and as publicly as it did. But even though you've got somebody under contract, when business changes and you're bringing in a lot of new people and there's that pay disparity, it's incumbent upon you to try to mitigate it as much as you can. So I would say, yeah, I, I would even stretch out and say, yeah, might have very well may have done a three year deal, but not a four year deal. Do you ever remember him having the favored nations clause in his contract? So he wouldn't have to do that. Oh, I know that's been a real source of debate over the years, and I'd love to see a copy of a contract that Favored Nations was in. Uh, is it possible that he had some Favored Na- Nations language in it, some limited, limited Favors Nation language, meaning that, yes, within the context of these definitions, you have a Favored Nations agreement, but there was context and there were limits. Uh, it's possible. I'll, I'll let it go at that. Okay. At Starcade, please go check out the show, by the way, in the archives. It's one of the all-time greats. Scott would attempt to help you beat Zabisco, but it does not work, and Nitro will not become NWO Nitro. I think you made the right call there, Eric, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. And, you know, that was a fun match for me. I sucked at it. I've never, you know, stood very tall and when talking about my in-ring prowess as a professional wrestler. Um, I mean, I wrestled in high school. I was a kickboxer. Um, I traveled around the country as a black belt competing. I was decent at that. But there's a big difference between working punches and working kicks and ones that are meant to do damage. And I never got good at the wrestling kind. I sucked at it, actually. Um, But I will say I had a ton of fun. I had fun working with Larry. Larry did his best to get me ready for that match. We worked out together at the power plant. I did fracture my knee about two weeks before my kneecap, oh. my patella, uh, I fractured on my, on my left leg. Uh, so that made it a little bit less fun, but the experience was amazing. You know, it was the MCI arena. It was a big crowd. NWO was hot as hell. I had a fair amount of heat at the time. Uh, so it was it was really fun. I think that was the first time I ever really stepped foot in the ring in, a, in, in the context of a match. Did you break the knee in training or doing something? Yeah, else? no training with Larry. Jeez. It just cracked it. It was a patella, not my, you know, my joint was, well, functionally I could still, I could still walk and shit, yeah. but yeah, I, I fractured, cracked the patella. 1998 would bring dis- dissension in the NWO ranks, but it feels like Scott and Kevin are on opposite sides. Scott seems to be on the Hogan side. Kevin is on his side. Was there a plan to split these two up? Yes. No. And then Mm -hmm. yes again. (laughs) And then maybe. And then definitely not. That was the nature of that story and evolution of the NWO. Here's why it's brought up. On Nitro on January 12th, there's miscommunication and Nash kicks Scott before Randy Savage interferes and tries to drop an elbow on Nash. 
And Nash moves and hits Rick Steiner, and the Outsiders regain the world tag team titles. I know that's a lot to read in one sentence. Is that possibly overbooked? I am the beholder, brother. Subjective. <laughs> Here's what I do whenever I hear this. You know, people, well, when people read the Dave Meltzer stuff back to me and how bad this was and how bad that was and how bad this was, I go, well, fuck, if it was that bad, how come we were stomping a mud hole in WWE each and every Monday night, making money hand over fist and selling out arenas all over the world? Didn't yeah, that's, us that's sucked, brother. None of this stuff made any sense. It was all bad. It was <laughs> fucking horrible. <laughs> in Dave Meltzer's little fucking world in his apartment, surrounded by, you know, 25 years of fucking hoarder clutter. Yeah, it was probably pretty bad. But for me and everybody else at WCW and Turner Broadcasting, it was rocking. Uh, was there money on your mind for Hall and Nash to not be on the same page? Was there money in them? Not being was there money well, in your mind? Yeah, yeah. Potentially. And again, right. it was, what do we do with this monster we've created? We've created this thing called the NWO. It's turned the entire industry on its head. We've reached levels of success in the wrestling industry across the boards that it had never experienced in the history of televised professional wrestling. Seven, eight, nine, ten million people a week watching either Monday Nitro or Monday Night Raw or a combination of both. But by 98, it was already, you know, NWO was a year and a half old at that point. It's like, okay, where do we go? What do we do? You know, we, we've got to figure out a way to continue moving this idea forward creatively. And that was about the time we were looking at different ways of splitting it up. Wouldn't there have been a ton of money in Hogan and Savage against the outsiders? I don't think so, man. I think really, I think the Hogan and Savage combination had played itself out. I could be wrong about that. Maybe as NWO Hogan and Savage, it'd be different, but I don't know. I just, it didn't feel like a go-to for me. It felt like, especially Randy, because Randy really had, I mean, both, obviously Hulk Hogan completely reemerged as a powerful character as a result of the NWO. Uh, and he, he reinvented or was reinvented uh, as a character as a result. Um, but I think Randy did too. You know, I think Randy was a different cat as a result of the NWO thing. Uh, so maybe it would have been a, a good move. I don't know, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a go-to for me. You guys don't ever remember discussing it as a, even a possible. Oh, I'm sure we did. I'm sure. Look, you're on a plane, you. you're on a three hour plane ride or yeah. private jet. And there's a case of beer on the plane and you're coming off a live shoot and your adrenaline's pumping and you've got a couple pops in you and you're having a great time and you're banging out all kinds of ideas. I'm sure it was discussed at some point, but not, Seriously. Uh, this is a, uh, a promo from Scott Hall. It leans and reads like uh, Eric Mis Bischoff must have been uh, involved in this. Scott Hall came out for an interview and said that when Larry Zabisco was AWA champion, it was because his father-in-law owned the company and that the company then went out of business and then said that Dusty Rhodes was a better wrestler than Zabisco was. Well, he was a bigger star. Do you remember that at all? I do remember that. And here's what's funny. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I guess that's what makes a great interview, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm listening to that. I'm going, okay, well, what part of this isn't true? <laughs> no, it's actually 100% true. Yeah. In January, Louis McCauley begins acting like Scott is his hero. Where'd the idea come from of Louis being paired with Scott? Hard to pin down who was the first person that raised their hand and said, Hey, I have an idea. Okay. It would have been collaborative. I'm I'm sure Kevin Sullivan had a big hand in that because Kevin was familiar with Louis Piccoli and, and ECW. I wasn't. I had I think I'd ever heard of Louis Spicoli until he came to work for me and people told me who he was and showed me some video. Um, 
I, so I would bet heavily Kevin Sullivan with a lot of input from Scott himself. That'd be my guess. Were you aware of Louie's issues at the time? No. I, was, I wasn't aware of Louie at the time. <laughs> Much less, Much less his issues. <laughs> I had sold out Dusty Rhodes. Yes, the American dream. Turned and became an NWO member when helped Scott defeat Larry Zabisco. This is just one of those things that you look back on and go, why the hell did we do that? Right, Eric? Yeah, I got to <laughs> okay. I, I gotta take that one on the chin. <laughs> okay. I need that. I got to take that punch. I deserve that one. Do you remember discussing it? Is there is there any pushback on it or did everybody jump on board and say, let's give it a try? I think, you know, I, I'm trying to remember, you know, I'm I, look and for the people listening, keep <laughs> in mind that I've listened to a number of wrestling theme podcasts and I've listened to people talk about incidents and situations that they were supposedly involved in. And they go into great detail, painting a story and a picture of what happened when, and I, was either involved in some of those or at least a witness to some of them. And nothing was further for the truth <laughs> on several occasions when I've listened. And that's why when I say I don't remember or I don't remember well enough to go into details, because I don't like to make shit up like everybody else. <laughs> I could make up some great fucking stories that would be entertaining as hell and make me sound like a really smart guy. But if I don't honestly remember, I won't pretend I do just to be entertaining or sound smart. My impression at that time was Scott Hall. I, Scott was really pushing for Scott loved Dusty. And Dusty thought highly of Scott as well. There was a long, long history. But Scott really had a lot of respect for Dusty. And I Scott was very much a proponent of that move of bringing Dusty into the NWO. I think everybody else, including me, by the way, just kind of went along with it. And partly because of our respect for Dusty, we wanted to see Dusty involved in something. Dusty was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Dusty just was over and could get over at the drop of a hat. So if there was anything resembling a reasonable story on the table invo involving Dusty Rhodes, there weren't going to be too many people standing up and going, no, that sucks. <laughs> so if it was something that, you know, a guy like Scott was passionate about, and if Dusty was willing to do it, because Dusty wasn't going to put himself in a situation he didn't want to be in. I don't think he would. Not with me. He would have at least pulled me aside. I mean, because Dusty and I had a pretty good relationship. Dusty came out hunting with my wife and I here in Wyoming. We stayed up in the um, the hills outside of the mountains outside of Sheridan, Wyoming, the Bighorn Mountains camped out in the middle of nowhere and hunted for about six days. Dusty was a friend. He wasn't just somebody I worked with. So if Dusty would have had an issue with it, trust me, Dusty would have come to me and said, Hey, Eric, oh, I'm not feeling this. And that would have been just fine with me. And Dusty knew that. So I think between Scott being excited about it and Dusty wanting to do it, at least being willing to do it and not suggesting that he didn't. Um, we just all kind of went along with it. From the observer, Larry Zbysko beat Scott Hall via DQ in eight minutes and nine seconds. Hall came out with Luis Bacoli, uh, who was his second flunky, uh, while Zbysko then brought out Rhodes. Rhodes has gained so much weight, he looked like a cross between Mark Madden and the late Adrian Adonis. <laughs> For an issue that has drawn so much heat for so many months, it was almost eerie, the lack of heat, once they actually got in the ring. There was nothing wrong with the match, as Zabisco's actual work was solid, and visually, he looked in better shape than when he was a full-time wrestler. But there was nothing good about the match either. There was a period where the match threatened to fall apart before they went to the finish. Hall, who was getting a... Pretty solid face reaction by this point. Delivered his fall away slam. He went for the edge, but Zabisco backdropped his way out of it. Hall came back on a few clotheslines that Zabisco didn't sell well. Zabisco never took clotheslines during his career. Zabisco was supposed to kick referee Mickey J and actually barely grazed the kick, but Jay sold it since there was no other choice. Hall had him pinned with no ref, but then Zabisco got Hall in a front face lock with a body scissors 
and Sapcoli interfered for the DQ. Rhodes ran in, delivered the big elbow on Spicoli, who sold it so well that if they could go back 13 years in the time machine, Dusty would have made him one of the four horsemen. Rhodes went to elbow Hall, who moved and accidentally clobbered Zabisco. At this point, Rhodes teased going after Hall, but then took off his shirt, revealing an NWO t-shirt, and Rhodes and Spicoli began dropping elbows on Zabisco, while announcer Tony Schiavone acted disgusted as Abisco was laying there to get sympathy. A huge Larry Sucks chant started again. I mean, Scott is, a, Scott is in line for a big WCW title shot in a couple months against Sting. He could have pinned Larry here, right? He could have. I mean, he could have done any number of things, but go back and watch that match and watch the crowd reaction. And that's another thing. Whenever you hear or read these things that Dave Meltzer, the, the way he frames them and characterizes them as being so horrible and such bad ideas and stupid booking and whatever bullshit that Dave spews at any given moment, uh, they just go back and you watch the reaction from the crowd because that's the only thing that matters. The only opinion that matters is the opinion of the audience. And it's reflected in the in the reaction at ringside or the reaction in the arena. And it's reflected in the television ratings. And in both cases, the live event reaction as well as the, the, the business side of it and the television ratings, we were blowing the doors off. It may not have been Dave Meltzer's cup of tea or even your cup of tea, Cassio, or even mine or anybody else's. It doesn't fucking matter. What matters is the audience and the audience dug it. For those keeping track at home, scoring along, he did give it one star. So I'd say he did not. It was not his cup of tea, but like you said, crowd pops, crowd works. He even said that, you know, they're they're chanting Larry sucks. They're into it and reacting. Yep. And that's from all Thunder. That from Thunder, Holland Rhodes came out. It was Rhodes' first heel interview, and boy, did he drop the ball to the point Hall actually had to cut him off because he was nowhere babbling about the people in the front office. They were mad at him six years ago when he was booking and ripping on Tony Schiavone and Hall talked about Piper. Is this just uh, letting Dusty go and Hall cutting him off to save the segment? Do you remember this? I don't remember the segment. I, okay. I really don't. And even if I did, it's hard to get inside of somebody's head 25 years ago to try to analyze what went wrong. Right. Uh, Dusty unlikely was a little on, or not, excuse me, likely was a little bit uncomfortable and more than anything, we probably didn't sit down and lay out the promo that we wanted him to do, you know, and that's, there's an upside to letting guys improv, especially, I mean, who's going to sit down with Dusty and say, okay, Dusty, uh, <laughs> Hey, Dusty, Eric over here. Hey, Dusty, come on over here to my office. I, I want to see you cut your promo. I want to hear what you're going to do when you get out there. <laughs> I was going to happen, dude. Dusty, Dusty was in that rarefied air. He was that guy that you just hope would be willing to pick up a microphone and cut a promo. You didn't have to worry too much about Dusty, but on this particular occasion, maybe he didn't have enough information or not know enough where he was going. And for whatever reason, he and Scott didn't work this stuff out. I would have assumed that they did. And perhaps they did and something else went wrong. I don't know. It was a moment. Not everybody's perfect. Not even Dusty Rhodes, although he was pretty close. In February, Hall and Nash would drop the titles clean to the Steiners. Uh, it was time, was it not? It was time. And it's also time to talk about my friend Steven Singer again. Yep. Come on now. You hate I him. hate Steven Singer guy. You hate him. I hate Steven Singer. Kidding aside, Steven Singer makes getting the perfect engagement ring for that special moment so easy. Unlike other jewelers, Steven doesn't mark up his jewelry just to mark it down and make you feel like you're getting some kind of a good deal. No phony sales, no coupons, no discounts, no pricing games, no Dave Meltzer bullshit. <laughs> just the perfect price every single day by real diamonds from a real jeweler that you can trust. Steven Singer Jewelers. That's I hate Steven Singer dot com. I love that. For those just listening, they should see you. You get full character in that. I don't do anything. You're doing facial characters. Character. Your facial. Ugh. I can't do the read without making facial. I can't. If I read this copy, I go into that mode. I just. Hey, 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 h
In late February, Luis Piccoli overdoses and passes away. Unfortunately, do you know who delivered that news to Scott? How did he take it? What do you remember around this incident? Boy, I don't, uh, I don't know. Okay. Obviously, I remember the incident. I remember it, right. it happened, obviously. But who communicated, how it was communicated, who learned of it first, there's no way I would have, I would have known. I, it wouldn't have been me. I would have found out. I would have found out more than likely from uh, if I had to bet Janie Engel, who was my assistant, uh, possibly Nick Lambros. But I, I wasn't close at all to Louie or family or really close to any of his friends. And I can assure you that I heard about it after guys like Scott and Kevin and, and a handful of others that Louie was close to. Um, it's been said Scott got Louie the job. Do you remember him feeling any guilt or anything like that? No. No. And look, Louie, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been you know, said publicly before, but Louis, Louis liked his somas. That was his thing. Whenever he had got a chance to go down to Mexico, he would come back with copious amounts of soma. Soma is a muscle relaxer for people that don't are familiar with it. And the reason guys like Louis, and there was a lot of guys that were into soma, a lot of them, including Scott Hall. Uh, the reason guys liked it is because you do whatever you do to get up, you know, and get fired up for your match in the evening. And then at night when it's time to go to bed and you're wired, yeah. Soma was a good muscle relaxer mixed with a couple cocktails that would put you out despite whatever recreational um, activities you partook in earlier in the evening. If you can read between those lines, who sure. couldn't, right? But that was that was one of the things that I remember uh, hearing a lot about was Louis and Somas. And Somas were they, they were horrible. I had never heard of them before until probably around ninety eight. And I remember sitting across from I'm not going to name the talent's name. It doesn't matter at this point. But I was sitting. I was having a conversation after the show, sitting at the bar. We're talking business. And it wasn't like everybody's pounding beers. I mean, you're having a burger with a beer. It's all we were doing. And the guy was sitting across with a normal conversation. Like I, I wouldn't have imagined he had a cocktail or took a hit of weed or anything before we were sitting there talking and we're sitting down and two, three minutes into a intelligent conversation. He just face plants into some mashed potatoes. <laughs> Somebody shoot him. What the fuck? <laughs> Did he just get Lee Harvey? <laughs> Boom! Just right in the middle of a syllable, he was like lucid at one moment and unconscious the next. And I, you know, I had to ask, I had to find out what that was all about, and it was it was all about somas. Wow, that sounds scary. It was scary. And then once I once I figured once I got educated, and I knew what so because you know I had bikes and perks and hell I messed around with bikes myself at the time um because if you mix vike with a mini thin and a couple beers it was like wow mini thin what's a mini thin mini thin is like a little you could buy them over the counter you can still buy them over the counter at any 7-eleven or fast food place uh or not fast food but convenience store it's just, they're caffeine pills they're highly okay. concentrated caffeine pills um but I had never tried Soma before. I didn't know anything about it. But I, I, got, I got a real education after that night when the guy was with face planted into his dinner. Uh, and they were a real problem. I think a, there's a number of guys that have passed away from Soma. When you hear about somebody falling asleep drinking and they never wake up, odds are pretty good that's Soma. Sounds like a scary thing to deal with. It is a scary um, thing. Were you, just to get perspective, do you remember at the time any talk or you personally remember worrying about if Scott would relapse because of a situation like this? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and, and again, I don't, I, I really want to be careful here because this is such a serious issue and I'm very careful about making statements that make it sound like I know more than I do. I've had a lot of personal experience with addiction and abuse because of the nature of being in the wrestling business for 30 years. I saw a lot of it 
dabbled myself. And I say that not for any other reason than to be transparent and honest. Um, but anytime you're working or anytime you're, you know, someone you're close to somebody, whether professionally or personally, that's got a serious addiction problem and you know, they're battling it. You also know that they could fall off that cliff at any given moment. You don't know when that's going to happen. And Scott had other issues besides his addiction. I'm not going to go into any of that because that's not my business. And he's not here to talk about it. But there were other issues that Scott was being treated for as well as addiction that compounded the problem. So, yeah, Scott was, Scott was trying. He really was. And that's another thing because we've, we've seen video of Scott when he was not at his best. Okay, let's be honest, when he was at his absolute worst. And we've seen that video. But what you didn't see is how hard he tried. And if you saw or you knew how desperately Scott wanted to be clean, but couldn't be and couldn't overcome that demon, if you saw the impact that that had on Scott, you'd be less likely to be critical and you'd be more likely to try to learn why and understand addiction and abuse and other mental health challenges. And when you combine those things, it's a time bomb. You don't know when it's going to go off. You may not even hear it ticking until it goes off. So yeah, I was worried about it a lot. So was everybody else. I was worried about it professionally, but also personally, but guys that were very close to Scott were very worried about that. At Super Bowl 1998, Scott Steiner turns on his brother Rick and helps the Outsiders regain the WCW Tag Team titles. Is it weird to see the Outsiders being a backdrop to a new member joining the NWO? No, I thought it was kind of cool. That was a big move. For the surprise factor? Yeah, and it's and it was just the right thing to do. Scott Steiner, look, I put a lot of people in the NWO that shouldn't have been in there, and I admit that, acknowledge it. <clears throat> But there were some people that needed to be in the NWO, and Scott <laughs> that Steiner was one of them. When I say needed, NWO needed Scott Steiner. That was a perfect fit. That was great perfect. casting. Great casting. As a fan, it, it did not feel for. It felt like you said natural. Like, yeah, why? Why is he not going to join the NWO? It did feel natural. And, 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 science, smash- and science tells us that the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep that's natural is by lowering your core body temperature. Temperature temperature controlled sleep repairs muscle after a hard day's work and improves cognitive function so you can always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Now, Sleep Me is the new home of Chili Sleep. That's right, they changed names, they're working on the brand, and Chili Sleep is now, take note, say it after me, Sleep Me. Sleep Me. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. And we are bringing you the same great sleep, great sleep that Chili Sleep offered, but under a new name. Sleep Me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core body temperatures, promoting deeper restorative sleep. Chili Sleep makes the Uller, O-O-L-E-R, you heard me right, Uller, Cube, and Doc Pro sleep systems, water-based temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide you ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for a deep, cold sleep. You sleep sounder. You wake up more refreshed. I can't recommend it highly enough. These sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy you need to power through your day, or in my case, my podcast. Now, they just launched the new Doc Pro Sleep System. It has two times more cold power than the other models, which is a lot, by the way. It's whisper quiet, won't keep you up at night, won't even know what's going on, and it has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling sleeping getting to sleep and staying asleep has been a problem for the majority of my adult life not anymore head on over to sleep.me 
forward slash 83 weeks to learn more and save 25% off your purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for 83 weeks listeners. I said exclusively for 83 weeks listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S L E E P dot me slash 83 weeks to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. The Uller literally changed me and my wife's life. It is I amazing. Mean, she, isn't it? she is at a different temperature. She likes it warm and hot and I like it cold as I can find it. We, we do different settings. I like to boost it. So I can get a little white noise going on. She is like, she has a toasty over there, but it, you know, we used to fight back and forth. Do we have enough coverage? We don't have enough coverage. Do we need a fan on? Do we need to cut the house temperature down? Now we just, we've got it even on the schedule. You know, you got the app going, boom, we go to bed and wake up refreshed. Like you said, Incredible. I wonder how many, I wonder how many marriages sleep me is safe. Like I wonder how many people actually stayed. Cause let's face it. If you can't stand sleeping together, yep. chances are by lunchtime, you're going to be at each other's throat. <laughs> And yep. everybody else around. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, I fully, fully recommend Sleep Me. All right. Sting is WCW world champion again after Super Bowl when he showed up with a small tan to beat Hogan again. And now Uncensored is going to be Sting versus Hall for the title on Nitro to build to it Sting and Randy Savage the first time WCW and NWO have teamed together in over 18 months, by the way. We'll take on Hulk Hogan and Scott Hall. Meltzer would have this to say. No attention being given to the Sting Hall program, as Hall might as well have been an invisible next to Hogan, as Francine is next to Sonny, as Hogan and Savage have become the total focal point of WCW. Thoughts? Uh, man, that was Dave's opinion. Yeah. Right. That's all that was. It was Dave's opinion and he's welcome to his opinion. He didn't state anything there as a fact that, that stood out to me. It was just, that's his opinion. And I disagree with it. Was Hogan and Savage an important part of WCW at that time? Yeah, absolutely. Were they the sole Focal point, I think anybody could go back and look at some of the things that were going on underneath matchups that Hogan and Savage were involved in and might find some pretty good shit there that got a lot of focus and attention. So from my point of view, I completely disagree with Dave's opinion. Um, and the fact that there was so much other good stuff going on underneath Suggest that Dave is, I don't know, full of shit. <laughs> uh, we've always been told that when Kevin and Scott didn't agree on something, they'd speak up. Do you remember? Did Scott care about playing second fiddle here to Hulk? No. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, he would have. He would have let you know about it. Correct. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There would have been nothing subtle about the 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 communication at all. But Scott really admired Hulk. He looked. He respected Hulk a lot. Let's break this down then, because in March the apparent shit is going to hit the fan, according to the Observer. The quote: the behind the scenes turmoil exploded over the past week between the. Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, power base, and the Kevin Nash, Scott Hall group that has clearly lost power at his, at his has been phased down during the same period the company is doing record business. There are a lot of things unsaid that appear to be extremely serious, whether this was just for being caught in the crossfire or for reasons we simply don't know. Six, Sean Waltman was given his written release on 3-9, and his representatives have already approached the WWF about going back. It was weird because even after he was fired later that night on Nitro, he was being plugged for autograph sessions, kicking off some first-day sales for later this week. 
as the announcers weren't given the word that he was gone. Nash and Hall did get significant interview time separately from Hogan on Nitro. Hall didn't do his survey and made a point of bringing up that he wouldn't be doing it. Nash put on a Hogan t-shirt, but seemed less than thrilled about outwardly being a good soldier for television purposes. The problems that had gotten bad enough that Bischoff noted that both were under contract until the end of 2001. And basically if they wanted to quit as the subject of them getting released was broached, they couldn't work anywhere else for that length of time, which was a reality check, but also invites people already with a reputation for being disruptive forces from working harder at living up to that reputation. A lot to digest here. How do you remember broaching the subject of Sean release to Scott and Kevin? Oh, I didn't broach it to him at all. I just did it. I mean, I found out afterwards. It was not, it's not like I had to check with him first. <laughs> Man, what the fuck? <laughs> what was, what was Scott's reaction? They were hot. They were hot about it. They didn't understand it. They thought it was too much. They, and again, they didn't, I say they, I mean, Scott and Kevin, from their perspective as talent, and especially because Sean Waltman was such, they were very, very close, the three of them. They're going to advocate for Sean Waltman. Yeah. And they didn't want to see him leave, man. They were, Sean Waltman was, was their buddy. The chemistry was great. And they didn't want to see it happen. But they weren't on the receiving end of being, swerved or manipulated or at least an attempt was made to manipulate and renegotiate a contract that was already renegotiated and agreed upon. It's just this shit don't fly with me. There's certain things that, man, I, I tolerated a lot of stuff. I forgave a lot of stuff. I tried to have empathy in a lot of situations, but when you fuck with money like that in a deceptive, dishonest, unprofessional way, I just, that's why Barry Bloom's name went on a list that it will never come off of. Cause it's like, once you, and to me, it's de deceit, you know, it's, it's not being honest and transparent. And when it comes to negotiating a deal and a contract and you're not being honest and, and, and operating in good faith that I've got zero respect, like none. And my reaction is pretty typical, you know, I react accordingly. Did you feel like them going out there like that was unprofessional? I wasn't happy about it. I had to tolerate it to a certain degree, but I wasn't happy about it. Cause that's the other, you know, the, it was a frustrating situation for me to be in because now you got these guys. I mean, as Dave said in his bullshit, um, the part that he did, well, that wasn't bullshit was when he said that this is financially record setting business. Mm -hmm. We were making money. Now, this is 98. We're making money hand over fist. We're blowing our budget out of the water in a good way. We're exceeding our forecasts that were made for us the year before dramatically. And a lot of it had to do with Scott and Kevin and Sean Waltman. But at the same time, you got to manage your business because if you let – one guy get away and his manager get away with one thing. Guess what? You're going to have that same situation about a week later. And then a week later, you're going to have two more of them. You, you have to draw a line in the way you conduct your business, even when it's going to hurt. And it, it did hurt. You know, it not only, it all, not only hurt to lose Sean Waltman because he was an important part of the NWO. I've said it on 83 weeks before. Sean, Sean Waltman, X-Pac, gave contributed a tremendous amount of character and action to the NWO that it really needed and, and should be looked at as one of the reasons why the NWO idea was as successful as it was. And I knew that at the time, it's not like I undervalued Sean Waltman. I just had to do what I had to do based on the, the way his manager was conducting business. I had to make an example out of him. I hate to say that, but it's true. Waltman and I are tight now. I mean, we're really good friends. We talk about it. We laugh about it. And in many ways, Waltman's grateful for it, you know, and he, sh and he should be because he, he took that negative situation and turned it into a positive in a big way. Sean Waltman was, in my opinion, the only reason Gen D Generation X really got off the ground. The fact that Sean Waltman left Nitro 
and the NWO in particular, and then in a very short period of time was now trying to kick in the back door with this new group, gave that new group all the credibility that it had at that time. Because to be honest with you, you know, the rest of the crew, while they're individually extremely talented, they didn't represent that kind of anarchy attitude that the NWO had that Sean Waltman brought with him with Degeneration X. You can undervalue that one can undervalue that all they want. But if you imagine DX doing what they did without Sean Waltman to give it that credibility and that, holy crap, I can't believe this is happening. Um, I don't know that it would have been as successful as it was. Perhaps it would. I don't think so. It's my opinion. On a, uh, just on a small note, just for my personal curiosity, do you remember, do you remember anything about the, announcers accidentally plugging him for autograph sessions i don't but i you know <laughs> shit happens <laughs> yeah. it's I live do. tv yeah. it's the great thing about live tv shit happens <laughs> and sometimes when when before the shit happens the right hand forgot to tell the left hand that <laughs> yeah. was gonna shit <laughs> i'm just a sucker for all that production stuff so i, I love to want to know uh, the original plan was to break up the Wolf Pack from the NWO in early 1998, which would put Hall and Nash in the top program working against Hogan and Savage. But Hogan nicks the plan, basically not letting them up to his level. Oh. It wasn't the time oh. to do an internal NWO feud. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, Let me wrap no, no. this up. And immediately after started the feud, but instead of bringing Savage back up to the top level and leave everyone else clearly in secondary issues. Uh, we got a lot as I can tell. I mean, that's reaction. Uh, honestly, Cassio, there's so much diarrhea in that. <laughs> that I can't, I, I can't even see through it enough to respond to it. It's just from top to bottom nonsense. Did Hulk nix it? No, that's it again. That's what you, you, I don't know if you, if you've ever played poker, but yes, you know, if you've got a tell that everybody else can figure out, you're not going to last long in poker, right? Right. And if you're a dirt sheet subscriber, like if you're one of the suckers that are stupid enough to separate yourself from however much money a month Dave Meltzer charges you to read his dreck, um, then hey, if that's what, if if you like that, if you're entertained by it, you like to walk around thinking you know shit that isn't true, but you think it is, they have at it. But Dave Meltzer's tell usually occurs in the first three or four sentences of whatever is about to follow, and because that's his that's his shot. That's Dave Meltzer taking his shot because of his personal animus towards any one individual or company. So when he comes out swinging right away at Hulk Hogan, because Hulk Hogan exercised his right creatively and refused, that shot is what, it's the minute I heard it, the minute I knew everything else I was going to hear afterwards was bullshit. Dave is not right in his mind. Dave fantasizes or images certain things in his head, and somehow between being able to form that picture in his head and the time he reaches for his keyboard, he believes it's true. He's not right. And this is another example of him, you know, taking that shot at, at Hulk Hogan just to get his narrative across it. And then everything else that followed it was just there to support the bullshit that he said in the first two or three sentences. <laughs> you said, of course, you know, a lot of ideas get thrown around at different times, but do you remember that, being the original plan to break up the wolf pack in the, from the end of the early look, he, here's the original plan. And there may have been kind of separate conversations along the way that were a part of that original plan. But the intent was at some point we knew we had to grow the NWO. We wanted the NWO to have its own show. We wanted WCW to have its own show. And in order to accommodate that, you've got to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with this NWO thing to make it work if we're going to move forward with that plan? Um, and that was the reason why we explored and, and in some cases attempted a lot of different ideas with, internally within the NWO, the Wolf Pack. It was an attempt to refresh it and expand it. 
That's all that it was. And were there common conversations as uh, that were part of that goal? Any number of them creatively? Of course there were. But I guarantee to you, Hulk Hogan never came forward and said, no, brother, I don't want to do that. I'm nixing that. That never happened. Hulk Hogan used his creative control clause one time, one time. He never even hinted about using it at any other point in all the time that I worked with him. And Hulk, and he didn't say, hey, remember, brother, I got creative control. That never happened either. But with regard to Starcade and Hulk Hogan and Sting, there was an issue. I've talked about it before. I'm not going to talk about it again. There was an issue. Hulk felt less confident that he wanted to feel in Sting at that moment. And I understood why. So I agreed. But it wasn't a, a combative situation. There was nobody throwing down, nobody threatening, nobody calling their attorneys. It was a natural conversation that led to Hulk deciding to change a finish. And I supported that change. Not because he had creative control, but because I could understand why Hulk felt the way he felt. At no other time, no other time, did Hulk Hogan ever exercise creative control over anything? That's not to say that Hulk didn't have ideas. That's not to say that Hulk Hogan didn't press for an idea that he felt really, really strongly about, just like anybody else on that roster. From the bottom of the card up, some more than others, obviously. He only used it one time. So when I hear Dave lying, because Dave is a liar when he when he produces information like this and distributes it as fact, and this is what gets me hot, it's not his opinion. He stated a lie as a fact. He's a piece of shit, and he's a garbage writer. He's not a journalist, nothing even close. He's just a waste of flesh. And he's lying to his readers and to anybody that, that, that hears him talk about this stuff because of it, it's his own personal animus. That's why I have no respect for him. Zero respect. I stepped, well, on some the- shit. I stepped in some shit on my way out here to the bunkhouse that I respect more than I do Dave Meltzer. <laughs> well, this is going to be fun then. Uh, in covering uncensored, Meltzer would have this to say, It's been more of the same with World Championship Wrestling, filled with turmoil behind the scenes and setting records in front of the camera and at the box office. The situation regarding Six, if anything, got hotter over the past week with no explanation as to his firing other than Eric Bischoff was trying to send a message to Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Waltman, who had approximately 18 months left on a three-year contract, was given his termination notice in a FedEx letter from WCW Vice President Nick Lambros on 3-9, and immediately his agent, Barry Bloon, opened up negotiations with the World Wrestling Federation. We've kind of hit on that. Already. Yeah, we have. All right, so he says, were you worried at any point with Waltman's release you would lose Scott or Kevin? Do you do you think that's an issue? Nope, wasn't worried about it at all. They were locked up tighter than... You weren't Trump. sending a message they, to them? They, and I wasn't, I told you, I explained why I let him go. I wasn't sending, I don't send fucking messages. I don't use smoke signals. I don't drop hints. I don't use a fucking letter. Ouija board. I don't try to cast spells on people. I just tell them right to their fucking face what I'm thinking and why. Whether it's a good situation or bad, I don't do hints. Hints are for gutless parasites. I just lay it out. <laughs> Uh, Meltzer continues, as the week went on, there was no contact between the front office at WCW and Waltman, although Waltman had been told by Nash that Bischoff had agreed to make everything right. Huh. That's not correct? Nope. <laughs> Many wrestlers... Uh, you know what? You know what? Let me, let me say, though, if I may, as a compromise, I may have suggested that if... Sean Waltman wanted to come back under the terms of his, the the deal that we had already agreed upon that I'd let him come back, but there was no renegotiating. Yeah. You had already led the terms. Like you said, 
you're already working with those terms. So no need to. There was no need to renegotiate. Would I, would I have let him come back under the terms of his original agreement? I probably would have, because I like Sean and he was valuable. Um, I would have done that, but I wouldn't have renegotiated. Many wrestlers, including some who would have been on the opposite side of the fence as Waltman politically recognize the problem with firing a wrestler with a wife and two children who is rehabbing a broken neck, suffered in the ring, working for the company for no apparent reason other than his friends were in a political struggle with the boss. Uh, and this was being done apparently to send the message to Nash and Hall, the latter of whom is in the midst of giving depositions in the WWF versus WCW lawsuit. I think you've covered that, that that's all a pile of shit. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Hall and Nash tried to rally the wrestlers together as a power base. The plan got to Bischoff in its early stages of formation. There were a lot of other problems that got deeper. On 3-9, there was a showdown where reportedly Hogan brought up Nash, wanting him out of the company, and Nash told him point blank that he wanted his spot, and Hogan told him that he wasn't giving up his spot. Reportedly, there have been some hypothetical talks where indications were given that Hall and Nash could receive comparable money in WWF should they be able to get out of their contract. But the idea of Bischoff releasing them is laughable because both at this time would be more valuable to Titan, which is sorely lacking in wrestlers that could challenge Steve Austin for the WWF title. Then they were at the peak of their Razor Ramon and Diesel days, but that isn't going to happen. Before we get moved further, uh, let's talk about this. Do you remember this? Did Nash and Scott, did they tell them they were coming for a Hulk spot, Eric? <laughs> I doubt Getting it. their power base together. Yeah. I mean, geez, you know, I, it's just seeing how much Dave Meltzer doesn't cover the nonsense that's going on in AEW right now. At least not, not because here he's making stuff up about, <laughs> things that are going on backstage in a or in WCW, whereas the things that are really going on in AEW, he tries to mitigate it as best he could while still covering it. The narrative is completely different uh, to suggest that. I mean, I can't even respond to it. It's so stupid. I really can. It's you, just ridiculous. You don't remember busting them in their early stages of a oh, I mean, it's, it sounds so interesting the way it was laid down. It's like, wow, was it really that much drama going on? I mean, there was drama. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't that well organized. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fucking chaos. He, it he was that right well that it was laughable that you would release them. That's the only thing you got right. That would be laughable. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be laughable. Hey, are you watching football? This yes. Week, today? What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm a Coles fan, so you know that's going to be bad news for me. It's not a good season going on. Not a who, good who season. Who are they playing today? I don't know who they've got today. Uh, mm. I'm so looking for. Some. I'm looking for. I mean, my favorite team is the Steelers, right? And they're not having a great oh. year. And today they're playing Tampa Bay. Yeah, I heard yesterday Tampa Bay's favored by ten points. I never bet football, but if I was going to bet football, I would, I would take the Steelers to cover at home. Okay, I think Tomlin's going to, Tomlin's going to, going to, despite the fact that Mark Madden doesn't think very highly of Coach Tomlin, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for him today. Oh, what do we got here? Woo! Steelers ahead of the, all oh, right, ahead of Tampa Bay, thirteen twelve. Come on, Pittsburgh, they're at the line. This as, is great. Yeah, as we go, Jacksonville is drubbing Indy in the third. So perfect. Perfect for me. Wow. Steve Kaufman. Look at that. Fingers on the trigger, man. <laughs> Look at that. He's rocking it. He's rocking it. Well, I'm going to watch some some football today. Okay. And I'm going to cook me some wings on the rec tech. Come on now. And kick back and just enjoy an afternoon of football. But if you don't have any wings in your freezer, or if you don't have a rec tech, you could do the next best thing. Woo! Wings open now in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Huntsville, Tuscaloosa, a bunch of new locations coming online. But if you want to in your area, uh, tell your favorite bar or restaurant to visit rickflairwings.com for more information on how to become a partner. 
That's rickflairwings.com. This is a virtual restaurant concept that essentially operates inside another restaurant, but with legendary flavors, these championship wings, the only ones worthy of carrying the nature boy's name. It's woo wings. You can order them right now on Uber eats or Postmates. If you're in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Huntsville, or Tuscaloosa, but tell your favorite restaurant or bar to check out rickflairwings.com. Let's continue and see if the drama builds on 316, Eric, that he says, uh, he being Meltzer, Hall and Nash definitely positioned themselves or were positioned as a part from the rest of the NWO crew with the exception of one interview where Hogan went out of his way to put Nash over. While the rest dressed in NWO attire, they came out in swim trunks, Hawaiian shirts, and flip-flops, building up to doing a comedy routine where Nash did a belly flop into a swimming pool to mockingly escape from the giant and kind of make him look like a fool. And Hall took a press slam into the pool from Giant to make a mockery of the whole scene even more when Hall and Nash in the interview were running down Giant. Hall actually said, Hey giant, that's your cue. What do you, what do you remember? You had to be pissed. It was getting a little loose. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds fun, but we're getting a little loose is a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. We're le- We're, Oh, I almost did it after I promised I wouldn't, we were uh, gravitating towards uh, comedy just a little too heavily <laughs> wrestling comedy and wrestling comedy is different than your comedy. Because your comedy is funny. <laughs> Most wrestling comedy isn't, except for the people that are doing it. They think it's great. You must know people like that. You must have comedian friends that yeah. think they're really funny, but really yeah. aren't. And nobody really wants to tell them. <laughs> if you read the comment section of every show, you're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, there's a lot going on here. I mean, yeah, but you're you're... You're also, you're trying a lot of things. You've got, like you said, you've got a live TV show to produce every single week. Absolutely. And trying different shit. And by about that period of time, things were starting to get a little hairy. We're still making money. Ratings were still good at this point that we're talking about now, March, April, 98. It would be about another month or two, and then the wheels would start wobbling really bad. But in the meantime, you know, the talent side of it was, there were issues. You know, it's so funny. I was talking about this the other day. It's like when Scott came in, man, he was like, he was a choir boy. He was like the perfect employee or independent contractor. But you know what I mean? He was perfect. And he was a contributor. He wanted to collaborate. He wanted to support, wanted to help. It was easy to get along with, fun to be around backstage. You know, same with Kevin. It was really easy for about a year, year and a half. But usually what happens is, and I've seen it happen with a lot of talent, is, you know, with Scott and Kevin in their situations, you know, they both, one of the big reasons they left, part of it was money. And, but the biggest part of it was their schedule. They just, neither one of them wanted to be on the road 300 days a year. It was just too tough on them. They had families, they had kids, wives. And WCW provided a a better situation for them at the same amount of money they were making all in or close to it, maybe a little more than they were making at WWE who wouldn't make that jump. And they were both thrilled. They were both so easy to get along with, but you know what happens with talent and money is they get used to that shit really fast. And they get used to the fact that they don't have to be on the road 300 days of the year. So the very reasons that they came to WCW in the first place after they've been in that position for a while, they just kind of took it for granted. And it didn't mean as much to them anymore. At least they didn't think it did. And that's when you start to lose them a little bit. That's when talent can become hard. And I'm not talking about Scott and Kevin individually. I'm talking about talent as a whole. Very few talents are mature enough and professional enough that once they sign on the dotted line, want to over deliver in hopes of improving their situation most talent, like most salespeople, take the path of least resistance. And eventually that becomes a, an issue. And that's about where we were at with both Scott and Kevin in 98. They both had reasons for being disenfranchised, pissed off, whatever you want to call it. In their minds, they did. Not in mine, but in their minds, they did. 
And that began to filter down into other relationships within the company, other talent, some management, as well as there's just general attitude in the ring. As we move forward on Scott's timeline, he is now set to take on Sting at Uncensored for the WCW title. This is from Meltzer. Sting pinned Scott Hall in 828 to retain the WCW title. Another match with far less heat than you'd expect. Hall worked much harder than usual and did a very entertaining job, but it wasn't enough to make up for Sting's stoic personality dying whenever he's in a match. Hall used a choke slam early to mock the giant. Dusty Rhodes was in Hall's corner and did some interfering, tripping Sting to allow Hall to level him with a vicious clothesline. Hall used his fall away, but Sting didn't take the bump right. Rhodes ran in and dropped the bionic elbow on Sting, but Sting kicked out of the pin. After a singer splash, Sting decked Rhodes. Ref Mark Curtis took a bump. Rhodes threw Hall a foreign object, and he hit Sting with it, but Sting kicked out of the sure pin. Hall went for the edge, but Sting got behind him and dropped him with the Scorpion Death Drop for the pin. One and a half stars. It's really I don't know. It sounds, like a, sounds like a hell of a match to me. <laughs> There's a lot going on. He uh, he did not enjoy it, like you said. But uh, it's really surprising to see this as one of the few WCW title match on pay-per-view with Scott actually in it. Was he just not able to get past Kevin and Hulk? What was the reasoning, you think? Hard to say, to be honest with you. I don't, I, I don't even want to speculate. It's just it's hard to say. I think reading that myself in the notes, I found it surprising. It's one of the only few title matches he had on a pay-per-view. I mean, it just, I guess it screams that he was, he felt like he was in a big match when he was in one, whether the title was on the line or not in the pay-per-view. The title was never really that important to Scott. It, it, it really wasn't. It was business. And Scott, Scott was such a smart guy. Scott knew. He's not going to make any more money with the title than he was without the title. What was important to Scott is that he was in storylines that mattered that were important and, in, and, and working with talent where he could have great matches. That was Scott's goal, generally. Having a title or not having a title was never a conversation that I can recall even having with Scott. It just wasn't that important to him. Well, just a few weeks later, though, from The Observer, uh, they say this. Almost exactly one year after checking himself into rehab, Scott Hall, 38, again, checked himself in this week. He is expected to be out of action until around the 427 Nitro taping in Norfolk, Virginia. Unlike last year, where Hall was still pushed on television as if he were still around and promoted as being in a pay-per-view main event match that the company knew full well in advance he wasn't going to be able to participate in. This year, his name wasn't mentioned once on television on the 323 Nitro. Eric, what do you remember about this time? Was anything different around this time? Um, it's got to be disappointing. We're one year later, and now uh, when Scott's footing in the company isn't exactly on Scotting uh, solid ground with the Waltman issue looming, a lot of things are going on right here at this exact moment. Yeah, there were, and I think the reason we didn't, try to keep Scott alive on TV is because at that point in time, we knew we didn't know exactly whether or not Scott was going to be able to successfully complete treatment. I mean, his issues were pretty, pretty apparent at that point. Scott was in bad shape and we just didn't feel comfortable telegraphing that we were sure that he was going to come back because we weren't. Kind of, a, um, you alluded to it earlier, and I appreciated it about uh, kind of speculating on somebody's mindset, especially when they're battling addiction. But Meltzer would speculate that Louis Piccoli's death spurred this on. Uh, do you? I know you mentioned earlier you guys were worried about it, but uh, did it ever come up as a, hey, man, this is just too much for me to deal with? No. Okay. That is, that's just Dave being Dave. Just making uh, you, shit up. Just making it up. You would go on off the record with Michael Landsberg and have this to say in regard to Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, neither of whom were stars originally in WCW, but became superstars in WWF. Bischoff said that the truth was McMahon wanted Hall to play a GI Joe character and the character of Razor Ramon, largely taking WCW's diamond stud gimmick and adding a Spanish persona to it was all Hall's idea. 
He said that McMahon should be recognized for giving Nash his break, but that Nash deserves the credit for what he did once he got the break. You still feel that way, correct? Yeah. Uh, from the Observer, Scott didn't go into rehab after all, but was instead is supposed to be doing three hours daily of outpatient counseling, although nobody knows whether or not he's doing it. Uh, I just want to stop right there. Is that a thing? Is that true? Do you remember? I don't remember that. Doesn't mean it's not true. Okay. Um, he says the situation at this point is that the leverage the top guys have right now is unique on both sides and that there really is limited discipline uh, over the long haul the companies can have over their stars because every top star knows they can't be fired because they'll just go work for the other side, probably with a raise. Nash and Hall have supposedly gotten an informal word that if they can get out of their contracts, which have 45 months to go, they'll find a $1.5 million per year deal on the other side waiting for them. Are you disappointed Scott didn't go the whole way through it? You you mentioned you weren't sure exactly then. Uh, but uh, did you think you guys kind of lost leverage? Because, yeah, they could walk across the street and possibly get a raise too. No. No. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about it. I mean, first of all, they were under contract. They weren't going anywhere. Now, if if someone breaches a contract, there were there was action that we could take to enforce the terms of the contract. I did it with Ric Flair. You know, when Ric Flair and I had our issue and he didn't want to do, and look, I don't want to relitigate that issue between Rick and I because it's been litigated to death and Rick and I have both gotten over it a long time ago, but when you have talent and you have a an issue where you can't reach an agreement under the terms of the contract and one party says one thing and another says the other, you settle it in the court. Um, neither Scott nor Kevin were going to go anywhere. And if the situation would have gotten out of control and they weren't doing what I needed them to do on television, I would have breached them and it would have been taken care of in court. It would have taken years to get through the court process before they would be able to go anywhere. They wouldn't have gotten a release and they wouldn't have gotten paid either until the court case was settled. And that was um, my leverage. That was, you never wanted to go there because that's, that's it. And once you right. pull the pin on that grenade, there's going to be collateral damage that you probably can't fix. But I always knew that if that was the case with either Scott or Kevin or anybody else, where while they're under contract, they wanted to try to get themselves fired or just not participate or not do what was asked within reason. And they were in breach of contract. I knew that it would be settled three, four, five years later. They would have had to hire attorneys. They would have had to pay for those, those attorneys for a long period of time. And at some point it's not even worth what what's left on your agreement, but it wouldn't have been a situation where I would have, capitulated necessarily over every whim because I was afraid I couldn't fire somebody. That was not the case. I might not have fired them, but I would have tied them up in knots. <laughs> uh, no shock and no inside scoop that uh, Meltzer's reporting that they would, uh, Vince would welcome them back. I mean, that's, that's pretty awful. Of course he would. Who wouldn't yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now they, they left both, both Kevin and Scott were huge stars. And guess what? I made them bigger stars. They were more valuable as a result of the NWO than they were when they got to WCW as Razor Ramon and Diesel. They turned our business, not by themselves, but with all in the NWO, turned WCW's business completely on its head. We were already defeating WWE before the NWO angle. If you go back and you look at the week to week, head to head ratings, head to head, not cosplay competition, real competition. We were defeating WWE at least 50% of the time. We'd win one, they'd win one. We'd win two, they'd win one. They'd, they'd win two, we'd win one. I mean, it was back and forth. But once the NWO angle hit, Scott and Kevin were part of it and drove it uh, and were the catalyst for it. You know, we never looked back financially for quite a long time. And Scott and Kevin were far more valuable to the WWE after the NWO than they were before it. Of course, he'd take him back. 
Scott himself would get himself into a situation just a few weeks later at an ECW house show. This is from the Observer Hall, who lives in the area, went to the ECW house show on 411 in Kissimmee, Florida, with just incredible PJ Walker, a friend from the WWF days. When he got to the back at about 5 p.m. before the crowd had arrived, word went through the dressing room, and he was cr- confronted by, among others, Shane Douglas, Bam Bam Bigelow, Chris Candido, and Francine. Douglas, Bigelow, and Candido all had heat with him, stemming from their days in the WWF. When the click ruled the company, and for various reasons, all believed they had fallen victim to their power. The situation, which lasted about 10 minutes, was described as tense with potential for problems, but all were sitting down and talking, although Douglas was said to be tense with veins bulging as he cut a promo on Hall, similar to interviews he's given in so many places about his WWF experience working with Hall as Dean Douglas. Bigelow, who left the WWF with largely other problems with McMahon's catering to the clique, was backing him up and making references to ECW not needing people with Hall's problems in their dressing room. After about 10 minutes, Hall called a cab and left, but not before Francine yelled at him to get in line and buy a ticket like the rest of the Marks. In a humorous situation where Tommy Dreamer, not knowing what was happening, walked by and saw everyone sitting down and Hall needing a ride and offered to give him a ride home. By the way, Shane Douglas admitted to apologizing about this when he realized Hall was invited. What do you remember about this story getting back to you? Zero. <laughs> like, like, I don't know if it ever did. Okay, so you I had mean, no feelings on it. I, I had no fucks to give when it came to anything re- regarding ECW, so it, it, did, it never got to me, honestly. Hall is still off TV going through his problems when DX showed up at Nitro for the infamous skit in Virginia. Did you ever talk to Scott about that and his feelings on it? No. Uh, There's some news from the Observer at the May 4th Nitro. Nash said the reason Hall hasn't been on TV is because Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan are afraid of what he might say in a live interview. After Sting... That might be true. (laughs) (laughs) We find, he finally got one. Uh, after Sting wouldn't turn heel and team with Hogan, Hogan wanted Hall to join his side of the NWO, recognizing he needed a strong partner to make the feud work. And perhaps, since fake storylines turn into real-life changes in Friends and Lovers, see Kevin and Nancy Sullivan and Steve and Deborah McMichael, maybe it would weaken Nash's attempt at a power base if Hall has, wasn't always with him. We'll have to see if Hall will agree to the idea, but the betting line is against that one, and even Luger's name has been thrown around as Hogan's potential backup. Dude, what kind of mess are you working with here, Eric? Uh, that's <laughs> Dave Meltzer's mess. I, I, I can't even I, – and actually, I want to skip to, skip ahead to, you know, November, December and wrap this thing up because I've been listening to so much Dave Meltzer bullshit, my head is starting to explode. I'm, I'm literally, I can hear the fuse burning in the back of my head. And if I have to sit through another 30 minutes of Dave Meltzer said this and Dave Meltzer said that, I don't know what's going to happen. It could be an ugly Sunday. You could be reading about shit <laughs> happening here in Cody, Wyoming. <laughs> so Let's do I, I can't see, I can't, I cannot listen to any more Dave Meltzer said. We're going to skip ahead to, um, let's talk about Scott uh, coming back uh, until the classic Nitro where Goldberg beat Hogan, and he had to beat Hall first. Uh, we're, let's skip ahead to that. Why was this the way to bring him back on television? Say that again, bud. I'm sorry. Scott didn't come back uh, after a while until the classic Nitro where Goldberg beat Hogan, and he had to beat Hall first. Mm-hmm. What about this idea was the way to bring him back on television? Do you remember talking about how we're going to get him back on TV, or was it just the time? No, I mean, look, he was ready to come back on TV, and then it just became a situation where we had to sit down and figure out, okay, what's the best way to do it? How can it have some impact and fit into the ongoing story or at least provide an opportunity to continue a story? That's all it was. It was, And it would have been a part of day-to-day business. It would have been like this big moment where we all got together and had to hash out how we're going to do this. I know in the minds of some, it may seem like that, but when you're writing TV and at that point in time, I don't know if Thunder was happening at that point in time or not. I can't remember anymore, but 
timeline. But if you're doing three hours or five hours with a primetime television every single week, not every decision is an earth shattering decision, although it may seem like it would be to a viewer or dirt sheet writer. Uh, as he comes back the next week on Nitro, the big story is the dysfunction between Hogan and Hall, and you're the referee for that match, so let's make sure we get this in. Uh, this is from The Observer. Hogan, no contest, Hall in seven minutes of a match, even worse than the pay-per-view match of the night before. Ungodly bad. <laughs> and that's on a show that had a Duggan match. Bischoff did the heel ref gimmick where he favored Hogan throughout. Uh, Disciple attacked Hall. Hogan moves like he's underwater. Page <laughs> did a run in and gave Bischoff the diamond cutter. Hogan and Disciple beat up Hall and Page. Nash ran in to help Hall, and they signaled like they were back together again. But when Nash tried to powerbomb Hogan, Hall attacked him. I don't think it's because they already saw the angle with Barbarian and Ming that there was no reaction to Hall turning on Nash again. It's because nobody believes it and nobody wants to see it. Hogan leg drop page and Hogan and Hall hugged when it was over. Eric, this is a swerve before Russo was even in play in WCW. What do you think of this story? And do you think it was executed perfectly? Oh, nothing was, nothing's ever executed perfectly. <laughs> First of all, the disciple was in the match. So that just wipes fucking perfect right off the table. There's nothing, there's nothing perfect about anything that involves the disciple. We're not okay. getting five stars when disciples in the match. No, we're starting with a no. handicap. No. And look, Hulk Hogan coming down to make the save at Bash at the Beach when Randy Savage was laying on the in the middle of the ring, and everybody thought that Hulk Hogan was going to, you know, save the day for Randy Savage in WCW, and then he swerved everybody and. Drop the big leg. So it's not like, you know, swerves weren't on the uh, list of, you know, menu items. Uh, they were. And this was a case where we used it, thought it would be entertaining, thought it would be interesting, thought it would advance the story. I don't remember how the crowd reacted, but I put a lot of money on the fact that they probably got a good reaction at the end of that match, which was the goal. I was about to say, which, like you said, that was the goal every single time. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're going to get to some fan questions because, look, there's no way to get, like you mentioned, Scott Hall's legacy as a wrestler is a long uh, history one, and we're not going to get it all in two episodes. So I'm sure we will wrap up his WCW, uh, WCW career. You and Conrad will wrap that up at some point in time. Eric, before we get to fan questions, why don't we tell these fans how to save with our buddy Conrad Thompson? Hey, real quick, want to give a shout out to James up in Stoneville, North Carolina. He's a friend of the show. Hell, he's a friend of the family now. We were able to go ahead and help his family recently save more than $1,200 a month. Really think about this. My man Robbie didn't save $1,200 one time. He's going to save it each and every month, all because he went to savewithconrad.com. He left us a five-star review earlier this week, and he said this. From the first phone call with Christian, all the hard work Diane put in, Jennifer taking time to explain things and help me understand where we were at with the deal, Right up to Steve helping me get this survey through. Nothing but professionalism all around. Dealing with First Family has helped us to the point we've cut $1,200 a month off our bills. I can't say enough about the team Conrad has assembled. I highly recommend First Family to anyone looking to purchase or refinance their home. Thanks to Conrad and the entire First Family team. No, thank you, James, for the great review. And congratulations on saving $1,200 a month. And oh, by the way, you can skip your next two house payments. It's real, folks. Savewithconrad.com can help you. We're licensed in more than 40 states. But if you've got credit card debt, if you're looking to save money on your monthly payments, if you're looking to pay your house off faster, or even buy a house with no money down, Savewithconrad.com is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. That's Savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And oh, by the way, you don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. What are you waiting for? Find out how much money you can save for free at SaveWithConrad.com. Let's get to some fan questions. Eric Francis Reyes says, was there any talent that we did not know that Scott was batting for to push? No, that's a really good question. But Scott never really went to bat for people per se. Like, you know. In, in, in a very obvious way. 
Uh, it never came to me and, and pushed somebody that I can recall. But you would see Scott, I would see Scott from time to time. If Scott saw something in somebody, if it was somebody, you know, in a lower part of the card or somebody that was just starting out or somebody that was his peer. I mean, look what he did for Sting. Scott Hall created the Crow character for Sting. And, and that character lives today and is making money today. So Scott wouldn't necessarily push for somebody, but he would definitely try to help somebody if he saw something in a particular talent. And I saw that pretty regularly, or I want to say regularly, but saw it enough that it, it stands out to me because you didn't see that a lot. You know, wrestlers, you know, it takes a long time to develop that skill, that art form where you get a real feel for the audience and, and you know what they want and when they want it and how they want it and why they want it. That's psychology, right? And, and Scott was a master of that, as well as being a master in the ring. He was one of the best of, of his era, especially for his size. Uh, and he was fantastic on the mic um, as a character. But he, w he wouldn't necessarily say, hey, you know, he didn't call me up at home or, you know, pull me aside when we we're at TV and say, hey, you really got to take a look at this guy. But he would spend time with people that he really believed in. And more often than not, um, he helped. Josh Henney wants to know whose idea was it for the NWO survey Scott did each week? He said, I love the no sale when he was booed. Classic stuff. That's, that's all Scott Hall. Uh, well, it got over. Again, that was awesome. Uh, Chase Terry says, this might be silly, but my OCD brain remembers Scott wearing his Razor gear under his Outsiders gear at one point as it was clearly visible on TV. Eric, do you ever remember this or care given the lawsuit in 96? No, I would have cared. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't remember it? I don't. That's an interesting one for uh, somebody listening or watching or the correct. Yeah, I'd like to go it. back and look at that, you know, because number one, I'd be surprised that that got by WWE and it didn't get added to the list of uh, evils that we purportedly <laughs> conducted ourselves in. But uh, no, I don't remember that. Uh, ABC, his name is at Chef ABC07. He tweets us at 83 weeks at E Bischoff. You said previously that you thought the NWO had only about a three-month run until Bash at the Beach when Hogan turned. Do you know what you, what you would have done with Hall and Nash if NWO was temporary? No. I don't. It's a hypothetical. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I could answer that, but I'm, I can't. Matt Godfrey uh, on 83 Weeks on Ad Free Show says, uh, why wasn't Scott ever WCW champion? Because he didn't need to be. Um, this was from Scott's original debut in WCW that you and Conrad never got to, uh, Eric Sedan said, um, in Scott's introductory promo coming from the crowd, he mentioned billionaire, Ted, nacho man, and even scheme gene, but not the Hulkster. Was this an oversight or did you already know that you wanted Hulk to be the third man? I'd have to go back and look at the date okay, to, in order to answer that On close the to accurately. Yeah. Yeah. Brad Stanton, did Scott Hall ever have any ideas that you didn't think would work at the time, but would work now maybe? Well, that's an open-ended question. Yeah, too tough to answer. And I can't remember all the ideas that Scott Hall ran by me. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> All right. Well, Eric, I appreciate you letting me fill in. I, Conrad, appreciate him letting me oh, fill in. Oh, brother, thank you so much. I always look forward to doing a show with you. It's it's fun. Next week, if all goes to according, Conrad will be back from Mexico. That's a big gift. Yeah, that's uh, a big gift, right? <laughs> if he is back, you will be discussing Kevin Sullivan. Oh, that'll be fun. There's a lot to talk about there. That'll be fun. Uh, you, uh, at over at adfreeshows.com, Conrad recently spoke with Bill after for the insiders series, the WCW world title was featured on title chase with renowned belt guy, Dave Milliken, Eric, you and myself, uh, spoke with Raven discussing your episode on him, which by the way, I found fascinating and it, I, I, I was really intrigued by what Raven had to say. 
Boy, so was I. And I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for setting in and, and doing that because it, uh, it was number one, it was great to clear the air. Not that I, I, I didn't realize there was as much air that needed to be cleaned as there was, <laughs> which is why I'm even more grateful we did that show. But it was, you know, Scott sounds like he's, he's on really solid ground. He's happy with his life. And, uh, he, he, he just sounds like a, a content individual and, and, a, and a happy one. And it was like, fun. It was fun to kind of go back and and see things from our own perspectives and then debate it. Um, and I got to tell you, Cashew, I didn't know going into it what to expect. I was prepared for either, you know. But it was really, really nice. And I'm gonna go see. I'm gonna be in Atlanta November 14th. So uh, Scott and I are gonna go out for dinner and uh, really catch up. So thank you for for being a part of that. No, thank you for letting me be a part of it. It was fascinating to watch you two uh, interact. Um, also on ad-free shows before we get out of here, there was a live watch along of Triple A's uh, Triple Mania and even Je uh, Jeff and Karen Jarrett ugh, sat down to discuss one of their top moments in Triple A. And coming up, there's going to be a Tony Schiavone live Q&A and Jake Roberts watches Halloween Havoc 1992 and takes your questions if you are a top guy all over at adfreeshows.com. Remember, you get all those shows early and ad-free, including this one, for as low as just $9. Like, subscribe, leave a five-star rating on all platforms. Follow us on Twitter, at E. Bischoff. I'm at the Casio Kid. Of course, the show at 83 Weeks. And if you're watching and consuming on YouTube, like, subscribe, comment, and be sure you turn on notifications. That's all at youtube.com slash 83 weeks. Mr. Bischoff, thank you once again. Casho, you, you saved the day, brother. Thank you for doing it. And I always love working with you and look forward to doing the next one. Thanks for watching. Thanks for Go Colts. Go Colts. <laughs> no, it's too late for that.